couple minutes late. Um, so I think we have uh, kind of friends from the Northeast Kingdom here for uh, for an hour, um, speaking on a variety of, of uh, issues. And I uh, appreciate you guys just generally coming to the State House today, but also making time for our committee. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for the record, we record our hearings for um, uh, just, you know, for the record. And, um, and and welcome. I think you have a, a slideshow too, which I'll, I'll pull up. So. Yeah. Good. Um, so I'm Evan Carlson. I am uh, an entrepreneur in residence at North Coworking, but also the uh, one of the folks behind the NK Broadband Working Group, yes. um, which is working to develop a CUD uh, across the three counties of the Northeast Kingdom. Nice. Um, so I guess I will uh, start out by thanking you guys for actually taking the time to speak with all the wonderful witnesses we have here today. Um, and I'll quickly introduce them before I give you a little spiel. Um, so today we have Chris Campbell from Tilson, who's the principal consultant there, and has been doing some work with our uh, NK uh, broadband group. Um, Michael Barenbaum from Kingdom Fiber. Uh, Ann Lawless from Neighbor Works and Heat Squad, and Jack Sumberg from the Glover Energy Committee, and Nick D'Agostino from uh, RTC or Rural Community Transit. Um, and so they will speak with you briefly. Sure. Um, so uh, I just want to start by saying uh, it was a year ago, almost to the date that I was in here telling you about the uh, feasibility study that was done by the Linden area kind of broadband working group. Um, since then, we have had many, many group meetings um, and have expanded with the help of the NEK Collaborative to be a much more inclusive group that includes um, representatives from over 26 towns uh, to help develop a CUD that will hopefully bring broadband to every household in the, the kingdom. Um, we have some pretty aggressive and lofty goals over the, the next couple of years, but really our end goal is to deliver 100 megabits per second symmetrical service to every household in the kingdom. Um, and we know that this is lofty, but we think that with um, you know the grant opportunities that are available and public funding that they already exist, there's ways for us to be able to get to that the goal. Um, and we also think that you know it's going to take us 10 years to get to that place. So starting at the you know 25-3 record that's in place now, or the uh, speeds that are in place now, is not the best place to start if we're going to be building this out and, uh, to completion in 10 years. Um, so we were fortunate enough in the past year to be able to have uh, NVDA. Uh, receive a USDA Rural Business Development Grant, which we use to be able to do some pre-feasibility studies to really look at what's the best configuration for a CUD, and I imagine that uh, Chris will elaborate on that a little bit in his testimony. Um, and uh, this CUD will be 26 towns to start, or that's all the current number of towns that are going to be voting on, on March 3rd. Um, and we have a pretty aggressive timeline after that to be able to get some grant applications in and look at things like CAF2 funding to be able to really uh, accelerate the build in that area. Um, you know, we can't understate the importance of broadband in our region, but we think that the formation of this CUD is the first big step to being able to make some progress on it. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to the first witnesses unless you have questions. Okay, quick question. Yeah. Sure. Uh, is this a uh, fiber broadband that you're building up? Um, we're looking, we're going to try to be technology agnostic at the moment, but fiber is what we believe is going to be the best option for being able to deliver long-term uh, infrastructure that will really serve the needs of everyone from now to the future. Um, how much trunk or <coughs> fiber do you have in place already? Well, if we were it's to just form the CUD, there uh, is existing assets between what uh, was built with VTA um, through Northern Enterprises. There's some potential assets that might be uh, um, an option to transfer. Um, so there are some other <coughs> large assets that could be potentially uh, included in the CUD that is formed in a pretty short order. So um, from here, I will uh, turn it over to Chris Campbell from Tilson. 
Um, oh, sorry, the one other thing I should mention is that behind you, you can see the list of all the towns in green here that are actually planning to vote <coughs> in March. Yeah, I really want to. Yeah, please. I, I really want to congratulate you all on that. That's a big deal. And it's a lot of work, and um, it is not going unnoticed. And I will tell you, in my neck of the woods, you know, I'm pointing to the kingdom and saying, you know, if you're doing it, you can do it, guys. So, so far. The thing that we tell everyone is that this is obviously the first step of a very long process and a very uh, probably a harder process for this. So, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, for the record, um, my name is Chris Campbell, and I'm a principal consultant with Tilson Technology Management. Um, let me just take a moment to um, uh, introduce uh, myself. Uh, most people in this room don't, don't know who I am. Um, so Tilson was re um, retained by uh, NVDA um, in the Northeast Kingdom to do what was called a pre-feasibility study for um, a CUD or CUDs in the Northeast Kingdom. The principal focus of that study was how many CUDs um, and um, to address potential um, funding sources. Um, briefly, as, as background, uh, Tilson is a company that does um, telecommunications network services and consulting broadly. And in our telecommunications network services, we do um, design, um, engineer, project management, maintain um, fiber optic and wireless uh, networks for network owners. So a lot of our uh, clients in that space are range from cellular companies and telcos to WISPs or municipalities. Uh, utilities are also a big um, part of our practice uh, there as well. On the consulting side, we work for um, organizations who um, are planning or looking to fund or build um, telecommunications networks and our clients range from state broadband programs um, such as New York, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maine, counties, municipalities, and private investors who are looking to make investments in telecommunications networks. Um, as for myself, um, I've been with Tilson um, approaching five years. Um, uh, I work um, out of Montpelier, Vermont. Um, the, uh, Companies you know, across the country, uh, but I, I work out of my home here in Montpelier. Uh, before I was with Tilson, I spent about 18 years in various roles with the state of Vermont, um, the last of which was executive director of the Vermont Telecommunications Authority, but I also had stints as the telecommunications director of the Public Service Department, and a brief stint as the assistant CIO for the state. So, um, as Evan introduced, the, um, these towns in the Northeast Kingdom are considering forming a communications uh, union district, and obviously there's a great concentration of unserved um, locations, and less than half are sort of meeting the current federal standard. Um, and you know, part of the reason that I can say that with some confidence is that um, the state of Vermont has, has continued um, its uh, broadband mapping efforts, and, and I just want to point out that um, the broadband maps that Vermont has and has continued to maintain throughout these years would, would be the envy of some of my other clients in other states. So the state, um, through the public service departments, have done a really good job um, maintaining that piece of information. Um, so I think it's fair to say a desirable uh, state um, for Northeast Kingdom CUD would be a you know, broadband network throughout the district maintained by professional staff and um, that produces enough revenue to service the set obligations. The question is really how to get there. Um, and in our study, we concluded that a region-wide CUD, not splitting the region into, um, into, into multiple CUDs, um, starting with the towns that are ready to vote this town meeting and get into a little bit about why that's important, would have the best opportunity uh, to take advantage of um, some fast approaching opportunities and, and overcome some of the barriers that new CUDs um, are likely to face. So I want to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, some of those barriers, some of the key assets and advantages that are in the, in the kingdom, um, and um, uh, one important key opportunity. Um, so CUDs have some challenges um, before they get off the ground. They're, they're born usually with few or no assets. Um, they have a major tool in revenue bonding, but they don't, they don't have any revenue to start with. Um, and they don't have a network generally to start with. They rely um, heavily in the beginning on volunteer talent. 
Um, and before they get their operations off the ground, they don't really have a track record as an ISP to show potential funders. So um, all of those are substantial challenges to overcome. Um, part of our recommendation was based on the belief that um, it was going to be easier for the region to overcome those challenges once and build on those successes than to try to go through that multiple times. Now, um, in addition to challenges, um, there are some advantages, and, and there was a question already about one of the mo more important ones, which is the Northeast Kingdom Fiber Network. Um, this is the, the, the network that was um, created through a variety of organizations from a variety of fun, um, federal funding sources, was um, assembled um, by the Vermont Telecommunications Authority, and it's currently maintained by the Public Service Department. Um, this network that is in place and through, passes through um, many of these towns would give the region you know, a head start, a, a leg up um, on, on the network that would ultimately need to be built and, and would have several advantages, not only as a you know, an initial piece of the network that would need to be built, but it also helps create opportunities to um, do chunk up projects and, and, and do them um, assigned to different, uh, different funding sources. So it's a really important um, asset and advantage to the region. Um, the town of Craftsbury um, and um, Kingdom Fiber are two organizations that have um, been working already um, to put pieces of that network to, to use. I won't spend a lot of time on that because Michael Birnbaum is here and I'm sure he'll talk more about that project. Um, in addition, um, there are quite a few um, electric utilities and um, we felt that there would also be um, some potential for cost-sharing projects um, between a CUD and those utilities um, that could be cultivated and developed. We also, in our, in our report um, to the NBDA, identified a number of um, um, potential funding opportunities. I want to focus here today, for the purposes of time, on, on one of the larger and um, one of the more fast approaching um, op um, opportunities, and that is the, the Federal Communications Commission's um, uh, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Connect America Fund and the CAF 2 auction, you can think of the RDOF as CAF Phase 3. Um, essentially, this is the FCC's proposal for how to allocate the next wave of federal universal service subsidies for broadband in rural areas. Um, the FCC has indicated that this is going to be a um, reverse auction that's very similar to the way that they did their um, uh, Connect America Fund um, reverse auction. Reverse auction means that there's a certain amount of subsidy available for an area and bidders bid down to take the obligation for lower and lower amounts until finally um, there are winners declared um, in the areas that qualify for subsidies. And we've helped um, uh, uh, other states um, uh, navigate um, earlier rounds of this. This um, uh, includes Pennsylvania and New York. Um, and we're currently assisting the state of West Virginia in helping potential bidders get ready for the upcoming um, uh, RDOF um, auction. Um, members of uh, the Broadband Consulting Practice. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt there, but you mentioned <clears throat> working with um, three states. Yep. But here you've been working with uh, NEK, right? Um, so we or, haven't we haven't at this point in time been engaged by them to, to, mm -hmm. to do that. But certainly, that's certainly in our wheelhouse to do it. Um, okay, but it um, but this would be an application by that particular CUD rather than through the state of Vermont? Or? Great question, yeah. So um, actually, um, one of the important um, observations is that a new CUD is not going to qualify directly mm -hmm. for the RDOF um, auction. Basically, you need to have been either an existing ISP for you know, a certain period of time or an electric utility in order to qualify. However, we do think that um, uh, a new CUD, um, if it um, undertakes a public-private partnership with an entity that can qualify, that's a way for it to participate. So you're essentially, you know, you'd be breaking up um, uh, a project into, you know, a services layer, right, and an infrastructure layer. Um, and uh, the infrastructure layer, uh, you know, in concept, this division between an infrastructure layer and a services layer is not 
it is very much like how the uh, most advanced CUD in Vermont currently operates, right? EC Fiber has an infrastructure layer. Mm -hmm. They have a hired uh, network operator that provides a services layer on, right. on top of it. So it's, um, it, it, it wouldn't, that kind of arrangement wouldn't, wouldn't be anything um, unusual, mm -hmm. I think, in terms of CUD operations. Frankly, okay. it's, it's the most common way that public, that municipalities that we work with um, very few municipalities that we work with um, are, you know, they're sort of in-sourced ISP. The most common arrangement is a public-private partnership divided along those um, levels of infrastructure and services. Thanks. Yeah. Could you, uh, again, say what RDOF is? Yes, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Yeah. Uh, sorry, that's a mouthful to say, which is why I can say RDOF. Um, <laughs> And the FCC. That's a federal program? It's a, a, a yes, a federal communications program, uh, communications commission program. Um, and the FCC has put out a proposal for how the program will work that they're voting on at the January meeting this year. Um, so, a few things to, to know about uh, RDOF. Um, first of all, it's big, okay? The, the, the program is proposed to be $20 billion with a B nationwide program. Um, 16 billion of that is expected to be auctioned in 2020. At least that's what the FCC proposal that they're voting on this month says. Um, uh, for context, um, the Connect America Fund Phase Two reverse auction, which was no small program itself, um, this is more than 10 times um, that program. Um, we haven't seen um, the the map of what will be eligible, but it's reasonable. Um, expectation that large swaths of the Northeast Kingdom will be eligible and um, likely to be won by somebody. Um, the auction rules that are now out to be voted on um, would favor um, bids from gigabit providers, um, but it could also go to a satellite if there are no strong bidders um, in an area. Um, and really important that this is um, a limited, a time-limited opportunity. This isn't an annual uh, process. Uh, areas that are bid on and won in this auction won't be available again for another 10 years. Um, so this is really a, a, um, uh, a time imperative um, opportunity for anybody who wants to see a high-quality network um, in this part or any part of the state of Vermont. Um, Excuse me? Yeah. Is this also uh, based on census block coverage, or is it going to be a different yeah, so um, I'll give you a short answer and then elaborate a little bit. Short answer is yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the the basic bidding unit, at least for the first round, are going to be census blocks. Or that's that's the proposal, and I would expect that will carry. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, uh, bidders will be required to build collections of census blocks uh, aggregated up into block groups or tracks. So you'll have to bid on all of the eligible blocks in a block group or tract. Mm -hmm. And um, the FCC um, has done some data collection from existing Connect America Fund recipients that's address level data. And they've indicated that they um, are likely to use that data where it's available. So the the round that their first round may include some partial census blocks where they have the information to justify that. And they've also indicated that they want to do um, some additional data collection. And the second round will focus on partial census blocks. However, I think it may be difficult, more difficult for somebody who hasn't bid in and won in the first round to bid on you know, partial collections of partial blocks that are adjacent to it. Right. It really seems like if you want to participate in this program, it's a good idea to try to get organized to do it in the first round. And then the second round, if you, you know, if there are additional areas that, that become available. Um, so um, just speaking as a, as a um, Vermonter, if I were able to wave a magic wand and say, you know, one thing that the state could do this year that matters this year and won't matter so much, you know, in, in subsequent years, it would be, um, really to create um, state in, uh, assistance, state incentives that will help um, high quality bidders participate in the auction and stay in the auction until the funding is cleared and the money can come to Vermont. 
um, that's very similar to um, the, the work that we did with the, with the state of Pennsylvania in, in the Connect America um, phase two uh, auction. That effort won't matter so much next year. It may, it may matter you know, uh, quite a bit to potential bidders um, this year. So, um, as I said, we've, we've completed um, this um, uh, pre-feasibility study. Um, some of the um, next steps, and these are really very near-term next steps, obviously, the vote um, to form and organize the CUD um, happened at this town meeting day, um, but, but also um, it would be a, a feasibility study where you start to get at some of the underlying economics um, of um, a broadband network in the Northeast Kingdom and ideally you know, tied to some of these geographic units that are going to be eligible for um, various funding sources. So let me stop there and um, just see if there's, if there's any questions, and if, if not, hand it off to the next witness. I just have a general question about, um, I don't know if there's an, an accepted uh, number mm -hmm. um, or metric as you're uh, creating a CUD. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that um, you've chosen not to bifurcate or trifurcate, but you've got a very large area that you're right. serving. Um, from a, from a business uh, standpoint, is there a scale that um, you aspire to in terms of customers, in terms of geographic area? Is there kind of a diminishing return size that you're cautious about? Um, this is a huge piece of Vermont and, yeah. and probably the most rural part of Vermont. Um, let, let me let me sort of deal with this, the last piece of that, yeah. and then go back to the first one. I, I think one of the things that we, we acknowledge, freely acknowledge, is that um, you know, the number of potential towns in this uh, has the you know, potential to create governance issues that the CUD would have to deal with. It's not, not trivial. Right? Uh, we just felt that the, that the benefits outweighed the, the, the disadvantages. Um, now, that said, um, 26 towns is you know, in the neighborhood of the size of EC Fiber, yep. which is established. So it's, it, you know, it has been done. Yep. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity um, with that initial set of towns to set some rules and processes around governance um, that how you would deal with an organization that large. I mean, I think you couldn't just, you could not have a 55 member board if you've got all towns and, you know, um, without having, you know, you couldn't have everybody involved deeply in every decision, right? You'd have to rely on, on committees and, um, and, and uh, you know, a certain amount of, of delegation. Um, so, I, as to the sort of critical mass size, um, I would say that um, um, there isn't a, one magic number. Um, it's not a bright line. I will say that you know we looked at, for instance, you know, possibility of dividing the region up in a north-south configuration, which was you know, we looked at a group that was you know about a you know ten thousand times as fast. We felt that that was um, kind of at the lower end of the range of you know sort of minimum desirable critical size. You know, so it was do you know from a, from a size perspective, it, it seemed like you could do it. You know, frankly, you know you could you could probably try to do smaller networks. People have done smaller networks. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying it's harder sure. uh, to do. That's all. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there are um, a whole host of things that the, that the, you know, any organization would have to do to get off the ground, you know, organizing itself, um, uh, finding vendors or partners, um, you know, going after, you know, uh, grant applications. And, and some of those just, you know, get multiplied by the number of organizations that you have. Right. I'm um, presuming, though, that there's an economy of scale there. Yes. You've got one organization that's right. supporting that. Um, you know, whether you've got 25 towns or whether you've got 45 towns, the support of that core mechanism, right. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's arithmetic. Right. Um, and at the same time, I know as somebody who's been in EC Fiber, one of the challenges is, is you know, what mouth gets fed first uh, in that CUD. Right. And if, you know, if you've got a smaller organization, you know, maybe it's easier to attend to... Um, you know, all your towns. So it, it, clearly there's countervailing forces, but um, you're advising. Yeah, so. it's, it's not, and, and what I, you know, your concerns are not 
uh, I would not dismiss them, yeah. right? I mean, I think that they're real. Um, I, I just think that the um, uh, that the benefits outweigh the drawbacks yeah, in sure. this case. Yeah. Um, you know, I think too with some of these funding opportunities that are happening now, um, uh, it's not. It's not a foregone conclusion that, that that the region has to choose between go big and go fast, yeah. right? And there may be a window where it can do both, right? Which would be sort of the best of the best of all the worlds. Um, and there are some some unique advantages to the way the existing fiber is is, is laid out that, that sort of argues in favor of a, of correct. a, of a large entire NEK uh, CUD. Exactly. Right? So yes. Yes, I mean, the the um, the um, the existing Northeast Kingdom fiber provides an opportunity to help get some initial operations up and running, and and generally speaking, you know, we think it's going to be easier once you have um, existing operations up and running to extend that to. Um, additional areas. So even if it was a phased approach, um, I think that there's still a good argument that even if you're not first in that phased approach, you may still be faster than um, than if you went alone yeah. or went separately. I just want to make sure that we had a chance to get everyone else to... Yeah, I got it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Michael Barnbaum. Um, I'm from Plainfield, not the kingdom, but I spend all my time in the kingdom these days. Um, I, I um, have two companies, a wireless ISP in central Vermont called Cloud Alliance, and a fiber ISP in the kingdom called Kingdom Fiber. And that's why I'm spending all my time in the kingdom. Um, before I go any farther, uh, Representative Sibelia thanked Evan and the committee for all the work they did to get as far as they have. I want to thank this committee. This committee in Act 79 did a remarkable thing, and thank you very much for everyone in the state. Um, so, last time I brought a, a real big poster board, I think, and showed you the map of the Northeast Kingdom Fiber Network that you've heard about twice now. Um, that is the basis of my company. Um, we were the only company early on to agree to commit to serving Fiber to the Home off of that network. Um, and um, as a result, we were able to get a very favorable um, leasing arrangement with the state of Vermont. Um, and it, it's mostly in the form of options, which we haven't exercised yet because we will do them as we develop different sections. Um, but we're poised to exercise the options on most, if not all, of it this coming year. Um, so the first project we did was we worked with the town of Craftsbury, which independently um, sought federal grants and won them to build a municipal network in their town. Um, they got money from USDA Rural Development and Northern Border Regional Commission and even the town put up some money of its own, and my company put up a considerable amount of um, labor, um, engineering and uh, design and uh, construction management. And ultimately, the town of Craftsbury ended up with a network that it, that it owns. So it's a municipal network, um, which covered about a third of the roads in the town and half of the population of the town and 90% of the businesses of the town. And the federal grants um, favored covering businesses and job generation. Um, it would have been nice to cover the entire town, but there wasn't funding to do it. So there was triage involved and selections were made. That network is built up and running, and there's service available throughout that network. In addition, all of the state network that passes through the town of Craftsbury is also up and running, and services available along that. So um, 
Last year, it was aspirational. We were close, but we couldn't say we were offering service. Now, everybody can get service along those networks. Um, the next step is to extend Kingdom Fiber's service along the rest of the licensed fiber on the Northeast Kingdom Dark Fiber Network, which is 170 miles. Um, so um, that will happen this year. And so we're, we're a private for-profit company, but we're working with uh, the municipality of Craftsbury, the state of Vermont, in, in terms of the Dark Fiber Network. Um, we're working with other pro um, public entities. We're very much a public-private partnership directed company. Um, we couldn't succeed without public input and funding, and the public entities need an operator that can make it happen. And so the partnership is a wonderful idea, and we don't see this proposed communications union district in the Northeast Kingdom as a threat. We see it as an opportunity. We, the CUD is going to need an operator. We can't guarantee that they will select us, but we want to be positioned to be very helpful to them so that they can be helpful to us and so that we can serve as many locations as possible. Um, so we're interested in the RDOF, which Chris was just talking about. We're interested in um, um, developing um, VITA-funded projects from Act 79, and um, we know that we'll be competing with other entities for that position, but we think because of our favorable lease on the dark fiber network that the state owns, or operates at least, um, we'll be in a very good position to help the CUD, and the CUD will be in a good position to work with us. Um, and I'll stop there because I know you have questions, and let's use the time that way. Um, and you can ask some of those same questions you asked Chris of me, because I might have somewhat different answers. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, My question is, what ones do you have different answers to? <laughs> um, none of them in totality, but all of them in subtleties, okay. Um, for example, I, I don't think it will not work to have the 55 town CUD, but I think it would probably work better if there were a couple. Um, and I would design one of them around the Northeast Kingdom Dark Fiber Network and one of them around the southern part of the Northeast Kingdom, which has more population, St. Johnsbury, London, and so forth. And those two might be good dividing points. However, NBDA and the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative is taking Tilson's advice, and they're going that route. And I think it'll work. It, it's just. We talked about the advantages and disadvantages. And one thought I had was that perhaps after they're up and running, because of the potential governance issues of having so many people on a board, it could bifurcate later. It could become two or three. So that's one answer. So I've got a question. Looking at the map, you know, like Irisburg is kind of uh, out there in nowhere land, Eden. Um, Connect. Uh, well, Wolves <laughs> actually on the list to, to vote on that, but uh, and it's connected to Albany, but there's no there's no connection as far okay. as roads go. So how do you get through those towns that, that may not sign on? So the company doesn't need to go only where the CUD is. The company can go wherever there's demand. Um, I'm expecting that most, if not all, towns will join the CUD over the next two years. Um, probably, you know, after the first round, you know, under under the law, to form a CUD, you have to get voted in a town meeting day. But after that, select boards can join. It's going to be easier to to grow that CUD if there's town interest. Um, in terms of how you get there, the Northeast Kingdom Fiber Dark Fiber Network <coughs> touches 22 of those towns. Um, it doesn't get to Lowell, but it's not that far from Lowell, and it, and it 
and it doesn't get to Eden, but it's not that far from Eden. And so many of the towns can be expanded too. There's some other ways to expand, and that's uh, utilizing uh, Velcro substations, because Velcro has an extensive fiber network in the state. And we're talking with them, and they are open to cooperating with us, um, both at the CUD level and at the company level. Um, so that you don't necessarily have to have one town contiguous to another to get to it. You can skip four towns, pop up on their fiber network in that town far away, and develop in that area. So um, any town can be reached. Um, it is just, let me throw in another thing. Um, the CUD's goals are 100-100 symmetrical, which is the state's goal by tomorrow. Um, and and RDOF says you have to achieve 25-3, which is the current broadband standard in federal. Um, there's no reason not to consider getting 100-100 wherever you can with fiber and 25-3 wherever you can't get to easily, quickly, with wireless, fixed wireless, and then overbuild with fiber later to other areas. There, no one needs to be left behind. Some people may get the 100-100 sooner. It's way more expensive up front. And fixed wireless ends up costing just about as much but over a very long time, the capital expenditures aren't as high. And so you can get to those places sooner using fixed wireless. So a hybrid approach um, is certain, I mean, the CUDs are going to certainly consider that. I, I left out that I'm on the board of CV Fiber, the second CUD in the state. And we are, we've been working for 18 months on this, and we won one of the feasibility study grants. And we are going to look at a hybrid solution but um, emphasizing fiber. I want to be attentive, as Evan said, to the other guests that we sure. have. So, um, but th thank you. Thank you, Mark. My name's Ann Wallace, and I'm here representing the Heat Squad. Yeah. And I thank you very much for, for hearing us. Um, Heat Squad does home energy audits. And my title, I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Northeast Kingdom. Heat Squad originated at NeighborWorks of Western Vermont, and it's still that's still its home. Um, NeighborWorks is an affordable housing agency, uh, similar to our own Rural Edge in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, but NeighborWorks developed this Heat Squad program to help people uh, save money and make their homes more comfortable through having an energy energy audit. So um, that's kind of uh, where we started. Uh, we came into the kingdom in 2018, and we're also in four other counties. Uh, it started in Rutland, then it's in, uh, branched out into Addison, Windsor, um, which are you know sort of nearby, and then uh, Bennington, and then and now the kingdom. So, um, how does a home energy audit work? Well, it starts with a three-hour visit from our auditor. She does a comprehensive look, top to bottom, inside and out through the home, looks at the you know attic basement uh, heating system, also does a health and safety check. Uh, we look out for mold issues, you know, is your house was your house built in the nineties or two thousands and it's it's uh, it has moisture issues, maybe not enough ventilation, not like those wonderful fresh air nineteenth century farmhouses we all love so much. Um, so uh, we provide a written report um, then we help the homeowner find the right contractor. So our report it functions sort of like, it's almost like a request for proposals. That works, that works really well. Another important thing, we're a neutral third party. We don't do the audits. I mean, I'm sorry, we don't do the work. We don't do the weatherization projects. We just do the audits. So um, a little bit about our impact. In, since 2010, in those, in those um, other four counties, well, actually including the kingdom, we've done 5,000 home energy audits. 2,000 of those folks, those homeowners, have gone on to do a finished project with, you know, where they hire weatherization contractors. In the Northeast Kingdom, um, our success rate is a little stronger. We've done 154 audits and 75 people have gone through with uh, a full 
a full project, and that's that's just since June 2018. So um, we collaborate. We collaborate with everybody that we can. Um, and Efficiency Vermont is our primary partner, and they're so important, I'm going to circle back. Um, but I just want to tell you about some of our other partners. We work with uh, NVDA, our Regional Planning Commission. They help communities, they help towns put energy goals, get those energy goals into their, into their town plans. Uh, we work with Rural Edge. We work with NEDO, which is our state-funded weatherization assistance program. And other climate action organizations are also, also really helpful. We work with community organizations at the grassroots level. I go to a lot of festivals and farmers markets and work with chambers and realtors and employers, as well as the local energy committees to get the word out about why this would benefit you and your neighbors. So now just to dive in a little bit more with, about Efficiency Vermont um, and your help uh, through the legislature, Efficiency Vermont, you know, uh, had some nice funding last year, and uh, we're, I'm not here to ask for more funds now, but you know, primarily to say thank you, and that that support for Efficiency Vermont has come has has come back to us um, in a way because we have a new partnership, a new contract that we just we just signed a couple weeks ago with Efficiency Vermont. So. Um, Everyone knows about the rebates for weatherization that Efficiency Vermont provides. That's that's you know that's the carrot. That's that's uh, that's pretty important. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the new program. Um, first, a little bit about the old program. To be a contractor to do that work, to get your customer the rebates, you have to be part of Efficiency Vermont's Efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency network. That's a process that a contractor would have to go through to get vetted. And not all contractors have the wherewithal to go through that bureaucratic hoop. So with this new process, we are going to be recruiting, working with Efficiency Vermont, recruiting new contractors, mostly probably smaller contractors who aren't up at that level yet. And we're going to be reaching out to them, asking them what they need, and then helping them with training in um, weatherization techniques and building science so that there will be more people out there doing the work so that we won't have such a big backlog. And uh, that, you know, that's a huge, that's, that's going to be a huge economic development driver, um, we feel. Um, so that's our, that's, our, that's our approach to uh, workforce development. Um, it's going to be good for the contractors because they are going to get the recognition that they need. Um, their customers will be really happy that their that their that their uh, their uh, contractor is helping them draw down the rebates. So we will still be involved, but it's not a it, it's a much more streamlined process. Instead of the full audit that takes three hours at the home and then another couple of hours to write the report, the customer is not going to get a a 12-page report. They're basically just going to get okay. You need the the most likely, the, the typical projects are you need, you need some more insulation in your basement around your rim joists where your foundation meets your, meets the, the wooden part of your house. Um, or most likely you need some more insulation in your attic because you're losing all that hot air that you have paid to heat. It's just going right, right, right up and, and through. So um, we think this is going to be, you know, really beneficial. Yes? Yeah. Um, so. When you when you train these additional contractors, yep. um, how's how's that training paid for? And this is part of the contract that Efficiency Vermont has signed with us. Okay. So I think that we will be doing that that we will be probably working with them to do the training. But I know we're reaching out to recruit um, new potential contractors, you know, by asking around and putting up signs at contacting lumber yards and things like that. Is there a fee for the contractor? Is there a fee for the contractor? The contractor, there's no fee to be involved in the training, I don't believe. Um, so did they get a certification or anything uh, at the end of the training? They are going to get something that I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but it will 
they all come under our umbrella because we are in the Efficiency Vermont Network as a as a as a home energy auditor. But they will be able to kind of come under our umbrella so that they can then get the get their customers the rebates. So um, if there aren't any more questions, just to, just a, a little bit more about um, gaps and opportunities, and uh, of course opportunities that's funding um, so we've been very fortunate uh, heat squad got its start with Department of Energy money back in 2010 uh, right now we're operating under a northern border regional commission grant and um, that's going to run out pretty soon but we've been invited to go back and the, I think the most wonderful program that really touched me pretty deeply was the, was V light funding um, that comes through our um, from, through Velco, and that was a project to support low-income Vermonters. So that was great. This summer and fall, uh, customers who wanted to get an audit, could they were subsidized. They could pay only $50 instead of $150. That makes a huge difference. And then V-Lite threw in another $1,000 um, in terms of that they could get for rebates for doing after they did the work. And that's, you know, supplementing the efficiency of Vermont money. So um, we're hoping that you all will continue to support weatherization efforts in the state. We feel that this is, this is, uh, it's really economic development. It's preserving our rural environment because we have this beautiful but slightly dilapidated housing, housing asset. Um, we don't want that to go away. That's important for it's important for tourism as well as for people to come and live and work in the kingdom. And then, of course, the um, the infrastructure uh, to support workforce development. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jack Sunberg. Uh, I serve on the Glover Select Board and also the Glover Energy Committee. Um, I'm here to talk about a project that uh, the Glover Energy Committee got involved in starting in the summer of 2018. Um, we learned about a nonprofit in Maine uh, called Window Dressers that um, produces uh, insulating storm window inserts that go on the inside of your windows um, and that do air sealing as well as increasing the insulating value of your windows. And they had uh, been uh, running a program in Maine that was quite successful and they were thinking maybe it could work in Vermont. They were looking for a group that could be the, the test run for it. And the uh, Global Energy Committee was looking for something practical that we could do that might help local people um, make their homes more comfortable, burn less fuel, contribute a little bit toward mitigating climate change. And so um, we met with people from window dressers and we said, yes, we'll do it. We'll be the first. So this is, this is a sample of what the window inserts actually look like. It's a pine frame wrapped on two sides with a heat shrink film, custom measured for each window. And then it just sits like this in the window. Most of the actual windows are larger than this. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, um, so we did that the first, in, uh, we did our measuring in the fall of 2018, in January of 2019. We got our first community workshop. One of the interesting things about this program is the way the windows are actually built. They, uh, you enter all the measurements into their software. They do all the cutting of the wood in their shop in Rockland. Then they put all the materials together, send it out to the local group, which could be a church group or a grange or an energy committee. And the local group organizes, finds a space, gets volunteers, including the people who are going to have the windows in their homes. And they all get together for three days or a week, depending on how many windows there are to build. And they build the windows using the material sent by window dressers. So uh, we did that in January in Glover, January 2019, and built 170 windows to go in 26 homes over four or five days. Um, that part of it, I think, is my favorite part. Now, people getting together, doing something, that is going to make a difference for themselves or their neighbors. And um, you, you know, we are talking about higher technology in the early parts of this hearing. This is pretty simple technology. Um, and uh, 
And so um, then this year, um, seven towns in Vermont are doing it, one in Thetford, one in Charlotte, um, Montpelier, uh, Bristol, and um, Craftsbury and Greensboro. So in September, the end of September, early October, Glover, Craftsbury, and Greensboro um, did it together in the Glover Town Hall because it was Craftsbury and Greensboro's first year, so we kind of mentored them. And um, I've been going around to the other towns on their first day of the workshop just helping them get started. There's just one left in Bristol at the end of this week. Um, there's quite a bit of interest in, from other towns in Vermont for next year. Um, so we'll see. It, you know, it may be uh, 15 or 20 towns in Vermont next year. So it's something that started in the kingdom and is moving out. And um, uh, we partnered with uh, Efficiency Vermont and um, got them to approve that these would be eligible for their uh, DIY rebate. So this year, people who purchased more than three, three or more inserts could get up to a $100 rebate um, to help cover the cost of those inserts. Uh, typical insert, you know, all, the price is based on size. Typical insert's about $40 in the pine finish, $50 if you want it painted white, on, if you want the wood frame painted white. Um, one of the nice things about window dressers program is that they, through grant writing, they managed to give away 25% of their windows to people who can't afford them. Um, and we've done that, uh, we've tried to do that as well in Vermont. We had, uh, Glover had a small grant, a spark grant from the Vermont Community Foundation. Uh, Energize Vermont gave some money to other energy committees to help fund. And um, so that, that, is, that would be a goal in Vermont as well, to make these available to people who can't pay for them. Um, the, um, the, 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 the other goal is to try to, you know, to get a little more experience with this in Vermont and then try to figure out, do we, do we uh, set up a sort of branch of window dressers in Vermont? Do we develop an independent organization? They have, this is their ninth year. They've made, probably by the end of this year, they will have made almost 40,000 inserts for Maine. And um, they figure that, uh, you can a, a wind search depend, in, depending on the quality of the windows that it's going into can save up to a gallon of heating fuel per square foot of window per heating season so they pay for themselves pretty quickly um, so well where how it'll go in Vermont we're not sure that's what we're we're trying to figure out if we stay with them if we form separate organization they have also developed an amazing array of very clever home built jigs and tools that make it easier for volunteers to build these, to do a good job of building these windows. And the, the, the workshops are a lot of fun. So um, I want to make sure we have time for Nick. Yes, yeah, so I'll question. stop there. Well, yeah. I, I didn't realize um, that for my uh, hometown had right. just done an extensive amount of work on this. Right. Um, that for Stratford built 240 inserts. Yeah, so it was huge. Was yeah. And it was like a barn raising. Right. Um, but we don't have much experience with how happy customers have been. You've got a year yeah. on us. How have yeah. people... Uh, I, I'm one well. happy customer. Okay. They made a huge difference in my house. I wish they had 20 years ago. Yeah. And um, yes, we get we get excellent feedback from people. Yeah. They don't work for everybody. If you have a cat that likes to sit in the window and bat at cluster flies, they're going to be a problem. The plastic film can take, you know, this kind of pushing, but sharp objects are a problem. So you also need to have a place to store them. Yeah. Uh, in this, it's good to take them out. The last longer to take them out in the summer, you open the windows. Um, so you need space to store them. So they. They don't work for everybody, but they work in a lot of places. Yeah. And they can work in old single pane double hung windows. They can work, they can really improve the performance of older double pane windows as well. Yeah. Great. Just quickly, any idea about durability? Um, window dressers, people say eight to 10 years. If the plastic, uh, if anything happens to the plastic, bring it back to any community workshop. They'll strip the plastic off, recover it for 10 bucks, and put them back to work. Makes sense. A little tear, you can just put a piece of clear packing tape on. Thank you, Jack. You're welcome. Thank you. So my name is Nick D'Agostino. I'm the executive director of Rural Community Transportation, and uh, we're a, a, a private nonprofit 501c3 public transportation provider. We cover all of the Northeast Kingdom, and we also cover um, Lamoille County. 
And so we operate fare free shuttle and commuter routes, and we also handle a lot of demand response or non emergency medical transportation. We're the Medicaid provider for the Northeast Kingdom and Memorial County. Um, <coughs> And we also have funding through VTRANS, obviously, um, and other, we're a subrecipient of federal grants that's administered through VTRANS. Uh, Medicaid is a huge part of our uh, funding as well, and then we also have some other programs that we utilize for transportation. Um, last fiscal year, we provided over 300,000 rides in our territory, and about 225,000 of them were considered demand response or non-emergency medical transportation. Uh, so, as you can imagine, it, it's pretty challenging to run a bus company in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, it's so so rural, and we don't have the, the population density in order to make routes efficient or cost effective. Um, and there's very few large employers in the region. Um, in fact, 21% uh, of the working population of the Northeast Kingdom leaves their county, their home county, in order to go work somewhere else. Uh, and also because of the ruralness, hospitals, critical care, uh, dialysis, grocery stores, substance abuse recovery centers are all centered in the town, so like St. Johnsbury, um, Newport, Morrisville, uh, well not even so much Morrisville. Um, so the population is very transit dependent. Um, so one of the ways that we have combated that is that we have air free commuter routes. Um, one of the routes goes from our most popular is from St. Johnsbury to Barry Montpelier. Uh, it also now links up to from uh, a bus that comes from Morrisville through Hardwick and Woodbury and meets in East Montpelier, and that will take you into Barry. Um, we also have um, a commuter route from St. Johnsbury into Littleton. And um, last year we provided about 12,600 rides to commuters, which is the equivalent of uh, eliminating 162 tons of carbon emissions. And we also have fare-free shuttle service in Newport, Derby, St. Johnsbury, and Lindenville as well, and provided 60, over 64,000 rides on those shuttles. And all of that, again, is fare-free, so you can just hop on the bus for free, just like the Capitol Shuttle here. Um, most of the transportation we provide is actually through um, our volunteer drivers. We have a pool of about 100 volunteer drivers that are utilizing their own vehicles and donating their time, and they're providing door-to-door -door transportation service seven days a week, and sometimes the trips are from Newport to Boston, if it's that kind of a hospital trip, or uh, it, they can be very long and very, um, uh, just very long trips. Um, we also participate in uh, several pilot programs. I raise my hand with trans every chance I get. Um, we, there's a program called Rides to Wellness, which we work in partnership with Northeast Kingdom Human Services, and uh, that's designed to try to uh, close the gap of any kind of um, transportation needs that Medicaid may not cover or any of the other programs. Um, and we also just recently launched um, a program it's funded by a, a research grant from the federal government that's designed to help um, those in uh, substance use disorder recovery and for job access as well. And that has taken off so quickly that um, we provided over 300 trips just in November. And it's an $80,000 grant. We're going to use it up within 12 months of the launch. Um, so it's a great success, but it also just goes to show just how dependent folks are in, in our area on, on transit and what it means to people's lives. And so we're frequently taking folks from Newport or St. Johnsbury to Brattleboro Retreat. Uh, when they want to go into recovery, the time is then to get them there, and we're utilizing this grant to be able to do that. Um, so we're also at the very, very beginning stages of working with VTRANS and VEIC to test uh, electric bus in our region. Uh, so again, I'm raising my hand for that. Uh, so that I you know, don't know if it's going to work well or not, but um, we're certainly willing to give that a shot. Um, and that's basically what I wanted to say to you is that uh, you know, ride the bus if you can, support public transit. I'm not here to ask for money. I did that with the Transportation Committee. but. Um, <laughs> You know, if, and just keep in mind that anytime you're, you're thinking about climate change initi initiatives, that there's a hugely transit dependent audience and population in the Northeast Kingdom. Just a quick question for yeah. you. Um, in terms of your customers uh, who have medical needs, um, is most of your demand because um, people don't have 
dependable transportation? Is it because of a medical condition they're not capable of driving? It um, could be both. And actually, yeah. in order to, so about 60% of our rides are, are funded through Medicaid. Yeah. Um, and in order to qualify for Medicaid transportation, just because you qualify for Medicaid doesn't mean you qualify for the transportation part of it. You can't have a registered vehicle in your household. You can't have someone who's living in your household who is able to bring you somewhere. So that's that's a huge number of people, yeah. a huge number of rides of people who just can't get anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that, so it sounds like the, the real focus is transportation and any greenhouse gas, thank you, uh, emissions or reductions might, might are a sort of a fringe benefit. So it's kind of, it's, there's kind of like two prongs. One is the commuters, that obviously those folks, um, about half of them have cars and they choose to ride the bus and that's great. Um, yeah. The other part of it would be the non-emergency medical transportation and unfortunately reducing carbon in that case is probably secondary because we have to get them to their appointments. If, we, if everybody had a, a Tesla and we could drive around electric cars all day, that would be wonderful, but um, that's not the case right now. Thank you. Right. So um, the volunteer drivers, are they use their own vehicles or do they? Yes, uh, they, do? Yep. they, they, they okay. use their own how vehicles. Do you, how do you uh, go about recruiting volunteers? I beg. Um, we go to different groups. Um, you know, it's usually a lot of referrals and word of mouth. So is there a list and people are available at certain times or is it just hit or miss? Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it would be that um, the idea would be that we have enough volunteers. They can make their own schedule. So if they want to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 8 to 5, volunteer, I mean, not work, um, then we would have that in our system and uh, they could basically do it as they choose. And how do people request rides? They call a central number. They call our central office. Yes, and then we have a we have a large call center of folks that are that are handling calls, folks calling in, they're scheduling the rides, and then we have a dispatch team that basically puts a puzzle together every day. We try to do everything has to be done at the lowest cost possible, so we have a lot of ride sharing going on. So there might be three people in one vehicle. One's funded by Medicaid, one's funded by the Elderly and Disabled Grant, one's funded by a private pay, but they're all riding in the same vehicle going to, you know, we might be dropping them off along the way to the final destination. Last question, just, yeah, just quickly, I was wondering about technology and, uh, and sort of a lift or Uber type, type of mm -hmm. service. How, how do you, how do you uh, envision that? So right now, uh, right now, every, this v -trans just rolled out uh, statewide a technology that we had been using for a few years and that's that our buses and several of the other vehicles are have GPS trackers and you can utilize the transit app and see where the bus is if it's early if it's on time if it's late uh, what the next stop is things like that um, you can also um, you can also contact us and, and we can serve as your Uber or Lyft in that case as long as we're not utilizing a federally funded vehicle Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate your time. So thank you for joining us, Matt. Thank you. Appreciate Chairman. you taking your time today. Um, uh, we just had about an hour of testimony but, uh, from some guests uh, from, the North, from the Northeast uh, Kingdom and um, speaking on a variety of things. Uh, we are going to turn our attention back to um, H688, which is um, something we've been focused on, I guess is the third, maybe yeah, probably the third week we've taken testimony on this, and you've um, been able to hear some of that. So appreciate sure. you being here to offer uh, for your thoughts. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, to the appreciate. Rest of it. Yes, my name is Matt Coda. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association, which is an organization of fuel retailers and energy service companies uh, that do business in Vermont. Uh, this is my 16th year working in the state house. 14 as an advocate for energy retailers. Uh, two years as a reporter. Um, so I know many of you, and, and many of you have heard me testify before, and so I, I try not to repeat what I did before, but I think it's uh, important for me at the outset to say to this committee, thank you. It was 11 months ago um, that uh, Chairman Briglin, uh, his invitation allowed me to bring in four of my members who were upset, uh, but I felt delivered testimony in a calm, rational way. Uh, you may remember Casey Cota, Bells Falls, Judy Taranovich of Proctor, uh, Peter Bourne of Morrisville, uh, and uh, Mamie Fletcher, of uh, formerly of Montpelier. He was the big, bald man who uh, grew up here in Montpelier, uh, from a truck driver to a heating tech to a regional manager. Now he's a, a trainer and a, and a safety consultant uh, working for Files Brothers out of Orwell. 
and you know, it was his story was that of a of a Montpelier High School grad that barely got through high school but became a um, successful enough working in the propane industry that he sent two of his kids to college, um, the first in his family. Um, and that's that's really what I'm trying to convey here is, is to recall that sentiment, which is there are a lot of good people out there that sell oil and gas, a lot of good companies that provide for their families and their employees, that pay their taxes, and are contributing members to our economy. And they're frustrated because they've been vilified, not by this committee, I thank you for hearing their, their concerns, but um, by this concern about global warming, about climate change, about this climate emergency that we're in. Um, and frankly, they're frustrated. And I'm the voice of that. And so I speak to you. I appreciate the opportunity um, about this issue. But just know that there is a concern outside this building from the people that are delivering oil and gas that their government doesn't want them. Um, and that's confusing to them because the government is our biggest customer. We sell 20 million gallons. The government pays us $20 million to sell about 15 million gallons of heating fuel to low-income Vermonters through the fuel assistance program. Um, the state of Vermont uses our fuel to heat their buildings and to power their plow trucks and their police cruisers. Um, we think we sell a fuel that's very important to our economy, uh, to emergency services, and to keeping people safe, warm, alive. Um, and we know that things are changing. We know that 300 million gallons of gasoline that we sell every year, we are going to sell far less. There's going to be 50,000 electric vehicles on the road, most likely in the next 10 years, and we'll sell 40 million fewer gallons. But we'll still sell gasoline. We'll still, we'll still sell, we'll just sell 40 million gallons less over the next 10 years. We can see it. We can see the trajectory. We can see what's happening with our convenience stores. They're focusing, the smart ones are starting to focus on groceries and other sales. But we're going to have energy deserts in our rural areas where people, where we won't be able to keep gas stations open because there won't be the volume because of lack of sales and people travel longer distance in order to get gasoline. But that's just the way it's gonna happen. There's gonna be more consolidation in the industry. We're feeling it now, but it will continue to happen. And we'll continue to sell less heating oil. You know, back in the 1970s, you know, heating oil was 80% of the homes were heated with heating oil. Now we're about 40%. We've lost half our market share in the past 50 years. And we'll continue to lose market share in gallons as people use less of our product because they have more efficient burners and boilers and furnaces, the homes are better weatherized, they have more alternatives to supplement their heating sources, be it electricity or biomass. Um, so from our perspective, we don't see a future in which we're selling more gallons. We understand that we're going to sell less. And we understand that we are vital in that transition to a renewable future. We understand that it will not happen as fast as some of the advocates, some of the young people that, that, that care deeply about this, which we understand and respect, um, it's not going to happen as fast as perhaps we want to. It may not happen as fast as the Global Warming Solution Act requires it to, but it is happening and we are part of that transition, whether we like it or not. Um, that's why you're seeing diversification from heating fuel dealers. That's why you're seeing gasoline marketers think about the future in a, in a, in a world in which they are selling fewer gallons which stores to keep open, which retail outlets to keep open. We have to, it's our business model. We have to think of it that way um, because, I mean, there's 87 signatures on this bill. Um, but our question, getting back to the underlying reason why you invited me here, um, is what is swift and decisive action in 2025 if we don't fail to meet our emission reduction goals? So I'm skipping ahead, not to the details of between now and then, but what happens if we, if we get sued, uh, the state of Vermont gets sued? Um, uh, Luke is a Luke Marlin is a is an excellent attorney, and, and and I've heard his version of it. But we know that these as these bills go to the other body and they get changed and amendments added, these are just general questions, not based on the original bill, but based on the concept of a global warming solutions act. So forgive me for that conceit. But does if we just sue? What agency is responsible for implementing this? We touch agency of natural resources just a little bit. Fuel on the ground is regulated by them. When it's combusted from a point source pollution, yes. But ANR doesn't touch combustion of automobiles. You know, they don't add excess fees on, on on cars. That's the DMV. So with ANR under maybe not this version of the bill, but on a future version of the Global Warming Solutions Act, 
be able to restrict the sales of combustion engine vehicles, the DMV, or, or put a fee or a tax? Or would that have to go before the legislature and the governor for approval? These are all questions that we have if we fail to meet our climate reduction goals as stated in the Global Warming Solutions Act. What happens next? Would we possibly have a recommendation from the 21 member climate committee? There is one fuel dealer spot on it. Thank you for that. Um, but would there be a recommendation of 20 to 1 to tell the agency human services to spend all the fuel assistance money on weatherization or electric heat and not on fossil fuel heat? Would the would a judge implement that? Would a judge it would a the climate uh, committee recommend that the ANR enforce some sort of fees or fines on oil heat equipment or put a ban in place? It's happening in Brookline, Mass, in Berkeley, California. I mean, these are the questions that we ask. What is swift and decisive action? We understand the calls. We understand the bumper sticker call for reducing emissions now because we're in a climate emergency. What we're trying to figure out is, for our businesses, for our livelihoods, what we're trying to figure out is what that would mean in five years from now. Um, what could a judge order the state of Vermont to do? And what recourse would have someone who was opposed to that action have? Would they be able to lobby their legis legislator or governor in order to change that? Or would it be implemented without a voice of the legislature, without a vote of the legislature, and without approval of, of the governor in 2026 or 2027? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but uh, those are questions that we have. Um, I know one of the, the folks that testified last time was uh, transitioning to some biofuels, both wood pellets and um, a mix of uh, biofuels. Um, do you have an idea of what percentage of either your retailers or wholesalers are switching to a combination of uh, well, I guess generally non-fossil fuel energy sources could be electric for uh, gas gas stations being uh, putting in electric charging charging stations, or um, you know the the wholesalers switching business yeah. models to accommodate what they see coming. Yeah, that's a great question, Representative Chase. If I may, um, think on the gasoline side, liquid liquid renewable gasoline doesn't show much process. They were talking about cellulosic ethanol, which we simply don't have, and we don't know if we will have. The much, much more common path for light-duty vehicles that currently use gasoline in the combustion engine is electric. We understand that. That makes a lot more sense from a business standpoint. From a selling the stuff that makes the car go standpoint, the retailers, uh, we know, or we assume, we're making assumptions based on studies and lots of people to get paid to figure out what the next business model is going to be. The 60, 50 to 60 percent of people that buy an electric car are going to fuel up at home or at work. So the opportunity to recover those lost profits of reduced sales of gasoline through the installation of electric car charger, there is some. You get them there, you sell a little bit, make a little bit of money. Maybe you get them in the store and they buy a sandwich or something else. That's there, but nowhere near what it is currently under the combustion engine gasoline model. Switching from diesel fuel, the future is bright for diesel. Or it's not as dim as gasoline, I should say. Uh, gasoline, we're, we're, we're clearly going to see significant declines. But diesel fuel, we don't have an adequate replacement for the diesel combustion engine. We, we can't move milk with electricity. We can't move granite with electricity. We can't move wood products with electricity. We need a diesel engine tractor trailer truck um, for our buses, for our, for our plow trucks our graders, for every, every, all that works the wood. We use, we burn 300 million gallons of gasoline here in Vermont. We're using 100 million gallons, 60 million of, of on-road diesel fuel, another 40 to 45 million of off-road diesel fuel, it's the same stuff, um, every year, because there is no adequate replacement for diesel combustion yet. Except for, you can use the same engines with biodiesel. So what you're seeing is, you're seeing in states which either have a low carbon fuel standard, like California, or you're seeing states like Massachusetts that, that have a renewable energy mandate, or in cities like New York City um, that have a renewable energy goals, you're seeing the use of biodiesel both in transportation, in off-road use, and in heating. Um, so 
could that be one of the ways that A and R, Agency of Natural Resources, adjusts the rules or the Climate Commission recommends that in order we achieve our climate goals? Yes, the path is laid out. The path is laid out where you could see the Climate Commission saying, well, we can't replace tractor trailers with electric tractor trailers, and we can't replace all, you know, the half of Vermonters that use heating oil, so let's mandate the use of biodiesel blends in that, and we can show the reduction in carbon, and that, that will probably happen. Like you can see it happening in the future. So anyone that comes to me and says, like Global Petroleum, or Sprague, or Morabito, or any company that has large tanks that sells to smaller dealers, they're saying, what's the future, Matt? Is the legislature going to require this? Are we going to have to make a significant investment in tank heaters to make sure that we can keep that biodiesel flowing? Are we going to have to make a significant investment in tanker trucks that can bring biodiesel from Nebraska, from Missouri, in order to meet these mandates? I say, I don't know. I'm watching and I'm listening. So that's part of it. On the on the propane side, yes, there are some renewable opportunities, but not like you have in Disco. Same thing with gasoline. So it's a mixed bag. So I'm going to jump in here on that just to um, follow on that question. Um, what are the supply dynamics in that market? Um, you mentioned it coming from Nebraska, but um, and some pretty large uh, metropolitan areas that are are drawing on that supply, whether it's Massachusetts, whether it's New York. Yeah. What, what's the supply of that? Well, of so so the key is the pipe, right? The most efficient way, the most cost-effective way, the least carbon-intensive way to ship any liquid is by pipe. So you got to get to the TEPCO pipeline, which goes from Texas all the way to Albany, and as long as you can, as long as you can, as long as you can load it, as long as you can have a. A pipeline operator is going to make sure that there there is a customer at the other end of the pipe. As long as it's, that's there, then that's happening. So right now, we're having a situation where they're not going to load it unless they know there's demand. Right now, it's just a simple arbitrage. You know, everyone asks me, how much biodiesel is in, is, in the, uh, is in my feeding fuel supply? I said, well, go to the Wall Street Journal and look what it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and find out what the price differential is between B100 and, and US, USL number two oil. And I can guesstimate how much biodiesel is in your, your truck or in your in your heating oil tank because it's simple arbitrage, except for in areas where, like California, which has a low carbon fuel standard, which it's meeting its carbon reduction goals through renewable diesel and biodiesel, or in areas like Massachusetts, which incentivizes biodiesel. Now, here in Vermont, we have something like that. It's called Tier 3. 2015, we successfully um, were able to include biodiesel both for transportation and for heating as one of the tier three initiatives that a utility could adopt in order to meet their goals of reducing carbon emissions for their customers. Mm -hmm. We're having some yeah. limited success with that, but they aren't required to do it. And frankly, it's more in their benefit financially to sell more electricity through electric heat pumps and electric cars. We understand that. So that's what's happening. Okay. Great. Laura, let's go. I'm just wondering what um, you might be seeing nationally in terms of best practices with small fuel dealers and their transitioning and how we might think about supporting them um, going forward. Yeah. If, there are, if there are other states that are kind of ahead and thinking about this and innovative programs that we should be considering. I appreciate the comment and because it is happening, right? I mean, we, you know, the olden days where the dairy farmer just used to sell milk doesn't happen anymore. And the days where the fuel dealer just used to sell oil doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. They're diversifying their products. Maybe it's propane, maybe it's biodiesel, maybe it's biomass, whether it's pellets or chunk wood, it's heating and plumbing services. I have a very large marketer in Addison County that is diversified into hemp. Um, uh, others that are doing alarm services and lawn care. It's just you have something of value that's not your depreciated trucks or buildings, but it's your customer list. And that relationship they have is sometimes stayed back 100 years, literally. So how do they, in an era where they're using, where they're selling less of their product, um, how do they do that? And, you know, quite frankly, it's different for everyone. You know, some will sell out. We're seeing fewer and fewer fuel dealers. That's clear, because I collect their dues every January. Um, and so that's happening. Um, others will diversify uh, into other products and services. Um, a lot of them are installing heat pumps. Some of them are doing weatherization. But nothing will replace the, the volume and the profit that, that liquid fuel sales do. 
So how, you know, one of the ways that I get asked, particularly when I'm in Commerce Committee, how can we support fuel dealers, local fuel dealers that, that understand that we're passing policies that will limit their ability to sell the products that they haven't selling for a long time. And, I, and honestly, the, 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 the biggest thing that, that my members, the, the fuel companies that, that ask me to represent them in the state house asked for is, we need people that can, we need skilled trades. How can you support, and I know uh, Representative Spillett did a lot of work with BDCC on this and, 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 and others have worked on skilled trades, but finding people that can uh, go from tech centers to our school. You know, I lobby for fun. I run a school. We train a thousand heat techs a year. How can we get them through the realize that they can go from a tech center to a VFTA training program straight to a job and where the age of 19 they can make $50,000 a year? That's a real thing, but we are having tremendous difficulty finding techs. And once you have a good tech, not only can they work on an oil burner, but they can install a cold climate heat pump. They can install a solar panel. They can install all the things. So it's finding people. That is the best way. If we have good people, we're fuel neutral. You know, you know we yeah. you don't blame the Toyota dealership for selling more Tacomas than Priuses. We we don't we we don't own the oil well. We're interested in providing services for our customers, but we can't do that without the skilled technicians and drivers. And that's the, when when people ask me, you know, we understand your sentiment, which is which is very very real. How, how do we help your local companies? How do they get ahead in this new economy? And, and frankly, part of it is skill trades. We need support there, and not just for our little corner of the world, but for for diesel techs and you know that type of thing. So that's my little sorry for speech. No, time, that's but. great. I mean, it's I mean, that was basically my question. Also, is is um, how, how your folks are transitioning from selling a product to selling a service to selling yeah comfort to selling. You know, and that's that's the that's the best thing to crack, and we need people who know how to how to how to do that, and we need, need text. So, since you answered that question already, I'll ask you another one. What, what proportion of, of fuel sales are, are transportation fuels versus home heating fuels, roughly? Sure. Uh, you know, depending on the year. Yeah. Um, of course, with heating fuels, is weather variant, but uh, with transportation, you know, you've got between 300 and 320 million gallons of gasoline, 60 million gallons of on-road diesel fuel. You've got 40 to 45 million gallons of off-road diesel fuel. That's for trains, that's for skidders, that's for uh, construction equipment, um, tractors, farm tractors. Um, you've got 100 million gallons of heating oil sales and 100 million gallons of propane sales. Uh, on the heating oil side, it's 70-30 commercial, and residential, commercial, 70% residential, 30% commercial. On the propane side, it's 40% commercial, 60% residential. Um, but essentially we sell 600 million gallons of liquid fossil fuels in the state every year, give or take 25 million. Okay, great, I need to go there. That you. But, Can but you see those first numbers again? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> which ones? Red, 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 yes, <laughs> on-road diesel, off diesel. Yeah, approximately, it yeah. changes from yeah, year yeah. to year, but yeah. you know, I, I, the round number is 600 million, half of which is gasoline. Then you sell 100 million gallons of, you know, heating oil and diesel is the same, heating oil and diesel fuel is the same thing, it's just color, that's the only thing that's different about it, and cetane. But 100 million gallons of, of diesel fuel, whether it's on road or off road, 100 million gallons of heating oil, and 100 million gallons of propane. Roughly, yeah. give or take, yeah. 20 million in every in direction, you know. Thanks. Mike, Avram Pamela. I'm sorry, was that your question or not? No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, so, wait, what? You're out. You're out. No more. I'm sorry. I just lost my place in the queue. Um, uh, I, I want to. Um, have you look into your crystal ball and uh, and you know because there are a lot of areas where we have said we can't replace fossil fuels yep. and we have with heat pumps or with I mean you know Casella trucking Amia's product but is that liquefied natural gas there yeah using? there is liquefied natural gas in some um, applications and yeah. yeah. and uh, you know we're looking at material handling like uh, forklifts being increasingly electric Oh. Um, where there's a lot of torque necessary, yeah. um, so there are we are switching away from fossil fuels in areas where we didn't think we could. And I just wonder. Um, I mean, I see that it increasing, but I don't. I, I have less knowledge of it than you do. We're that also shift. that is true, but we're also moving to less carbon-intensive fossil fuels in some applications. I mean, we're selling right. a lot of propane mowers. 
you know, so propane has less carbon at the at the burner tip than, than like the trucking. Yeah, yeah. And and a lot of those uh, forklifts are propane powered, mm -hmm. um, so that's happening as well. Um, you know, so you know, there's police cruisers that can be outfitted as for propane, um, and school buses for propane as an auto gas. You know, that's still a fossil fuel, mm -hmm. but it's less carbon intensive. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, gasoline is is the obvious target, right? So gasoline, there's a pathway for for electric cars if the manufacturers produce them, and if they don't, you're still going to want us around to sell gasoline. Um, and on diesel fuel, the, not so, not so. You, you can, uh, there is not a an affordable tractor trailer truck that can haul lumber out of the woods, or granite out of Barry, or or milk out of Arden. I mean, it just this doesn't exist. Um, um, so yes, there are different applications where you you, know, you can have electric lawnmowers. That's a, that's a good example. Um, but you know, in terms of um, in terms of heavy duty transportation, you're always going to need number two fuel oil to run the trains that haul the haul the goods around the state and around the country and you're always going to need it to, to move stuff in a tractor trailer at least for the next 30 40 years i don't know what happens yeah. after that my crystal ball is a little fuzzy <laughs> thanks um i just, I'm just yeah. curious in terms of you're talking about uh, yeah. business, businesses your members and all needing to planning for the future and transitioning yeah. I want, I, I, if you could say so, at least in general terms, what portion of the non-transportation fuels in, in Vermont are being sold by, I, I don't know how to, how to define it, but the smaller, the mom and pop, the local, for the family versus the Irving Energies and the large companies. Yeah, they're, well, the large companies are consolidating as much as the small companies. Okay. Um, no, it's definitely broken up into a third, I think, in thirds. From my perspective, you know, a third of the gallons are the large companies. A third of the gallons are the in-state operators that are um, are are providing multiple services, diversified. Think Borns or Coda and Coda or, or Blanchard. And they're selling multiple products and services, including plumbing, heating, and all that, weatherization, all that stuff. And then the third are, you know, uh, just trucking. They just own the trucks, and they're local, and they're real local. Meaning they're, they're very small territory, and 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 people ask me what's the future of, of my industry, and I said more. It's just going to be more of the same, just less of it, right? I mean, you, there are going to be fewer of those companies, but it will still will always be someone with forty thousand dollars that can go buy themselves a used truck, and 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 get themselves a cell phone, and and work their tail off in the winter and deliver fuel. There'll always be that. There'll always be those companies, local companies that take care of their employees that have that loyalty from their customers who say, I'm not going with this guy or that guy or this woman or that woman. I am going with this company because they've been here forever and they provide great service. And then, of course, major MLPs will always be around and always be a player um, wherever they are because they're capitalized to do so, like suburban and America, gas and Irving, those companies. <coughs> Mike? Yeah, so uh, I acknowledge that, that the, uh, the fuel dealers and your services, your businesses, have a lot of value in this. It's not going to be, there's always going to be a demand for, for some amount of uh, fossil fuels, diesel, uh, gasoline, or whatever. Um, the fuel dealers aren't the problem, though. I, I see it's, it's the impact that burning fossil fuels has on the environment that's, that's a real problem. And I hope I have a good relationship with my fuel dealer because I expect him to deliver fuel when, when, I, when I need it. <laughs> um, I've had good discussions with them, and I get the sense that they that there is a reluctance to acknowledge that we have a problem, that climate change is a problem. Um, I don't know how to deal with that because I think that every, no matter what business you're in, no matter what uh, field you're in, change requires adaptation the ability to either learn new skills or develop another service to fit the evolving economy. And I would hate to see them, you know, be the buggy whip manufacturer that refused to stop making buggy whips uh, when the automobile and uh, the combustion engine came along. So um, 
I think that, that what we're trying to do with the Global Warming Solutions Act is, is put in place a roadmap where we can achieve the greenhouse gas reductions that we need to uh, to address a real, a real essential global problem, and we have to do our part. So I would like to see us work with the uh, fuel dealers to, to try and figure out what that appropriate roadmap would be. I, I, I appreciate that sentiment, and uh, if, I, if I may, Mr. Chairman Brigland, to address the first point, which is, um, this is my 14th year representing the fuel dealers in the legislature, and uh, you know they're all my children. I love them equally. Um, but just like your constituents, they, they have a wide range of views, and, and I don't know which ones you uh, uh, you bump into from time to time. But I can tell you um, that there are no climate denialists on my board of directors. I can tell you that I spent last Tuesday night in Jericho at Mount Mansfield Union High School. Um, with a group of Republicans and a group of Climate Energy Committee people. And I was somehow the moderator of the debate, <laughs> where I found myself in the unique perspective as an oil lobbyist of explaining to the Republican Jericho Committee that the climate emergency is real, the science is settled, and here's what's happening, while explaining to the Climate Energy Committee that we cannot stop selling this product because it's vital to our economy and to our health and safety. Um, and we're not going to ban the combustion engine. Um, at least I don't think we should. Um, so that's a weird spot to find myself <laughs> in. And, uh, but I credit my board of directors who have tolerated me for 14 years and understand that what I speak, I speak from, um, uh, from here. Um, so there's that. Yes, can we work together on a, on a process? I think that's happening, but I'll be quite honest with you, Representative Antoshka. The, the bill that came out last year, the first version of the Global Warming Solutions Act, that was me telling my members to sell their company in five years if this passes as written, where they could be sued, assistance right of action could happen, and they could be sued for simply selling a legal product. Um, that was, that was, that was a very serious moment where I said, you pay me to tell you the bad news and the good news. Here's the bad news. Sell your company in five years if this passes. So now I come back with them and I say, here's the second version of the same titled bill. You don't have to sell your business, uh, but for me to get them to endorse it, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Um, can we work within the parameters? Yeah, we're going to have to, right? Save you seven signatures on this bill one would assume it has enough to pass. <laughs> um, but we have real fears. We have real fears that swift and decisive action in five years is unknowable right now to us, and I can only make assumptions on what it could be. And it could be, possibly, depending on which legal, which lawyer you talk to, and I'm not a lawyer, um, bans on combustion, bans on burners and boilers and furnaces that use fossil fuels, bans on vehicles that that consume fossil fuels, could be new fees or fines associated with the combustion of fossil fuels. I don't know. I don't know what swift and decisive action is in five years when it's mandated by a judge. Um, I know ways that we can reduce carbon emissions in heating and transportation. I don't know if it'll be as fast to meet the goals of, this, of the GWSA, but I certainly know what swift and decisive action is. We've seen it in other communities that have, um, that have forwarded uh, regulations or legislation that, that essentially puts a time stamp on when this activity can no longer happen. That's tough. Yeah. So something I want to be um, sensitive to is we've got other guests who yep. are following Matt sure. who have traveled here, yep. and I know we have the benefit of you, you know, having you around, that's so that's we, that's we can also have you back. Sure. Um, but. Um, we, we've run 10 minutes yep. over now, and I'm the one guilty of, of uh, slowing us down. So um, I think we're going to cut this off now, okay. and I'm um, happy to have you back in the, in the coming days to complete testimony. Sure. Complete. I know members have questions. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Um,
Thank you. Uh, my name is Casey Whiteley, and I'm here on behalf of 350 Vermont. Uh, I want to thank you, Chair Brigham, and the committee for the opportunity to give testimony on H688, the Vermont Global Warming Solutions Act of 2020. As I said, just said, my name is Casey Whiteley, and I'm here today as a parent and a grandparent because I care deeply about our environment and about the precarious future in store for the next generations of Vermonters due to the climate crisis that's upon us. I'm a member of the 350 Board of Directors, and I currently serve as the Board's Vice Chair, and I'm here representing our statewide constituency. 350 Vermont is a grassroots organization formed in 2011 that organizes, educates, and supports Vermonters to work together for climate justice. We are an affiliate of 350.org, which is an international environmental organization addressing the climate crisis. We greatly appreciate that this legislation was initiated and has been co-sponsored by 87 House members. This broad support is a positive and hopeful sign that the legislature takes this matter very, very seriously and means to act to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and to set Vermont on a course away from fossil fuel reliance and toward renewable energy sources. Again, we're grateful for the opportunity to submit testimony today. The breadth and scope of H688 addresses many concerns 350 Vermont shares. We're here to highlight the areas that we feel need to be strengthened in order to meet the challenges of the climate crisis. With our limited time today, I'd just like to give an overview of our primary concerns and offer some ways the bill can be strengthened to be aligned with the urgency of this task. We strongly recommend that you use the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or generally known as the IPCC, report as the guide to set the greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirements in the bill. The IPCC provides scientific assessments on climate change and is the best and most current science available. Second, we think it's essential to accelerate the timeline for action. H688 calls for a planning period of over a year to July 2021. Rules for implementing the plan will not be determined until July 2022. This means if there's funding that needs to be found to enact the plans adopted under H688, we could very well be delayed until the 2023 legislative session. While we recognize the importance of an up-to-date and a comprehensive plan, we cannot afford to wait two or maybe even three years to begin to take meaningful action. Given that the vast majority of scientists around the world all agree that we have little more than a decade to implement drastic measures if we are to hope of preventing the worst impacts of climate change, we urge you to accelerate the timeline of this bill. We simply do not have two, possibly three years to devote to planning before taking any action. We believe it's essential that the legislature put some immediate action steps in place, and there are many steps that we know are essential and effective that we can make now. For example, enact a ban on all new fossil fuel infrastructure. We need to resist the pressure to use and transport fracked gas in Vermont so that we can begin to move in the direction of renewables. Weatherization of inefficient buildings. Begin with all municipal buildings and the homes of people at the bottom of the income scale. Strengthen our focus on building local renewable energy generation and storage of electricity. Empower citizen input and local decision making. The bill's current structure is top down and we believe the impetus for change most often comes from the bottom up. We need to listen to Vermonters most affected by climate change and empower all Vermonters to act in their own communities now. We would like to offer an expert witness to the committee to address what we see as the severe inadequacies of the right of citizen action section of the bill. We look forward to providing additional testimony to help ensure 688 is strong and effective legislation. And I'll thank you again for your time and your commitment to this critical issue. And I'm happy along with my fellow 350 Vermont board members who are here today to answer any questions, but would also like to give the floor since we have limited time to our to our young people who are here today to testify please so thank you so much thank you that'd be great if, if you want to join us here or and, and i and if it's okay uh 
Chair, can I pass around a copy of the testimony? You, you're welcome to, and, and I would say what would be even more helpful is if give you... Give it to Danielle? Yeah, if, if you make okay. sure that Danielle sure. has it, we'd like to post it to our website so that everybody can see it. Right. And gotcha. Thank you. A little less paper. Um, hello, my name is Evelyn Seidner. Thank you for this opportunity to give testimony on an important piece of legislation, the Global Warming Solutions Act. I am a senior at Burn Burton Academy, a resident of Middletown Springs, and an officer of the Vermont Youth Lobby. I'm here today because we are facing a threat to humanity and the world unlike any other, the climate crisis. Every day, the consequences of climate inaction become more dire. According to the consensus of scientists, there is no longer time to stall or debate certain policies. Now is the time to accept that we have pushed the facts of science aside for too long, and now is the time to do whatever it takes to save the planet. We are nearing the point of no return. If bold climate legislation does not get signed into law very soon, we will have failed the only home we know. We will have failed future generations, and we have, will have failed my own. Our Earth has provided everything for us, but we have exploited and destroyed it to its breaking point. Together, we must do all we can to save what is left of the home we know before it is too late. Everyone must do their part, Vermont included. While outsiders may view us as a green state, our carbon emissions have risen since 1990, while emissions in our neighboring states have fallen. Vermont may be small, but what we do matters. Passing strong climate legislation this session would show the rest of the country that the climate crisis is an existential threat and should be treated like one. The Global Warming Solutions Act could do this. This bill takes an important first step towards positive change by making reductions goals into requirements. It also directly cites the IPCC in its legislative findings, legitimizing the bill with real science and facts on which to base our actions. However, the Vermont Youth Lobby and the Vermont Youth in general believe that the timeline in place for making these reductions in emissions happen is still not aggressive enough. Last November, the Youth Climate Congress brought together youth from all over the state to call attention to the seriousness of the climate crisis. From that day came a climate declaration. Youth wrote and voted on the declaration and in it, the goal to achieve net zero by 2032 in accordance with what science is telling us. While the Global Warming Solutions Act does acknowledge the destruction our state, country, and world will face if we continue to delay action, the current reduction timeline doesn't fully take into account the importance of acting as fast as possible to reduce emissions and support a transition into a carbon-free state. On page 4.3 of the bill, there is information about the vital importance of substantially reducing emissions over the next 10 years, but the bill has emissions being reduced by only 40 over the next 10 years, which is not enough. The reductions timeline doesn't reflect what science is telling us or what the youth who will be the ones left to deal with the consequences believe is necessary. I am fearful of what my future will look like in 50 years if action is not taken now. I don't have the luxury of pushing aside the need to act on climate because for me, this is going to be my life. Inaction is worse than action and we all need to do our part. I urge you to do yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair and Committee, uh, for allowing me this opportunity to speak today. I uh, appreciate you guys hearing my voice. Um, my name is Seth Fisher Olvera, and I'm a coordinator with the Youth Lobby. Uh, as a member of the youth, I can say with certainty that the climate crisis is on our minds. The headlines from Australia and California are hard to ignore and make it clear that action needs to be taken immediately. Vermont has too long lagged behind in the fight against climate change, and it is time we stepped up. The Global Warming Solutions Act would be an undeniable step towards saving my generation's future. The bill would promote job growth in our state, create a realistic and comprehensive process to achieve important carbon emission targets, and push legislators towards even more action in the future. With that being said, I believe that the targets set in this bill do not go far enough. At the first annual Youth Climate Congress, more than 170 of Vermont's youth 
from college students, high schoolers, and middle schoolers stated that they want Vermont to be net zero by 2032, whereas H688 doesn't have us reach that benchmark until 2050. Again, thank you for listening to my voice, and I implore you to remember the youth who are not here today, whose futures are also at risk. Do you mind all of you being available for questions if, if, uh, if the committee members had them? So I have a highly technical question for you, and, and I ask this with a straight face, although you know people may. In this bill, um, in terms of the group of people that we uh, would, or this bill would propose to bring together, um, we're looking for a um, uh, someone that would kind of fill the, the youth seat, if you will. Um, and I've gotten questions from people offline on the committee that said, "How do you, how do you, how do you define youth?" Um, you know, is this someone who's in high school? Is this someone who is under 25? Is this, um, but you know, as you pull together a group of, you know, youth activists, how do you define your group? Um, and you know, as, as literally, if this bill becomes law and we look to, well, I can't remember if it's the Speaker of the House of Representatives or um, the Senate that appoints that youth seat, um, how do you characterize who, who fills that seat? Is it a high school student? Is it a college student? Is it, um, I don't know. How, how did you characterize your group in terms of the Youth Congress as to who could participate in that? Was it only high school students? Was it? Was there an age limit? Um, I think I can speak to that. Um, yeah, and I think that's a good question. I hope that me being here today, Evelyn being here today, uh, the Youth Climate Congress, I don't think it is about age. I think the youth representative, um, it doesn't need to be a college student, it doesn't need to be a high schooler. Um, I think, I hope that we're proving today at the Youth Climate Congress that it's not the number of our age that matters. Um, I think what matters, um, the person who would be best to fill that um, spot is someone who shares the vision for uh, an economy that is clean, that's net zero, and eventually, hopefully, we could decarbonize. Um, I hope that that person who fills that seat um, is not judged on their age, but rather um, their ideas and how, how willing they are to, to push the legislature and, and have the vision that's going to you know, bring us towards a healthy earth. And I would say that actually falls in line with other testimony we've taken that um, if we do have a council, people who serve on that council shouldn't be representing an, you know, an industry or a part of the economy. They should be bringing a perspective. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, that, that's actually helpful, uh, I think, in, in terms of perspective. I don't know if Evelyn or Casey, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I mean, I can speak to what we did for the, um, the Climate Congress, which I mean, we had ages ranging from elementary school up to um, graduate school. Mm -hmm. So, um, as Seth was saying, I don't really think it's about pinpointing a specific number of what youth is, but um, I do think that under 25 is would be considered. Well, it, that's what we consider yeah. youth. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Robin. You I have one. But no, please go ahead. I don't want to. Um, so uh, thank you for being here. Thanks, Evelyn. Evelyn's my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. But I had nothing to do with getting hurt. Yeah. Uh, um, the challenge that we're looking at is what, you know, we're looking at a transition that is by nature, by design, disrupting our economy, the way we function, the way we do things, and replacing it with another, uh, another economy um, and society. And, and that disruption can, can be managed or it can be catastrophic. Um, and we're, you know, we're looking at a, at a time a tight time frame recognizing that we've heard we have 10 years. I doubt that it's that long before um, action is, change is, is reversible, irreversible. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, as you know, when you said it's your lifetime that we're looking at, and, and we're looking at either managed chaos or unmanaged chaos, and I'm just, I guess, wondering um, as the people who bear the brunt of the transition as well, um, how big a, a disruption and, and transition are you willing to put up with? 
who are you willing to? And, and I realize that doesn't have a, an easy answer, a clear answer. Uh, it's more just a, expressing to you the balances we're trying to find, and I'm interested in your perspective on that. So you, just to clarify, you're talking about a transition to a, a green economy, yes. not the transition to more chaos. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just they, wanted to. They, they, they will not be mutually exclusive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the way that I look at what we will have to do in order to mitigate the climate crisis in a way that is effective enough to stop the damage, like the, the most damage that we're seeing, um, I kind of see it as inevitable, not in that it's going to happen, but that if it does, it has to be really big. And there can't really be an in-between, like, oh, well, you know, we tried, so that counts for something, because it doesn't, really, because if we only go halfway, that's still failure. We kind of, we have to go all the way, or else it's nothing. With this with this threat, it's all or nothing. So for me personally, I think, I mean, it needs, I and I know that it's going to be a huge change and it's gonna be a lot of work and it's, I mean, it's rethinking the systems that have been in place for hundreds of years. Um, that's my thoughts. Thank you. I don't wanna cut you guys off. I have thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think everyone covered a lot of it. Um, I think, you know, it continues to be, um, this process is like, you know, like we're saying, we want it to happen as quick as we, you know, uh, we want, the time frame is short and we want action as quick as we can. And that's part of what H688 does is it's setting up that timeline and it's also pushing legislators for more action. This isn't a one and done deal. The Global Warming Solutions Act isn't gonna solve climate change and, I, and the, in and of itself, the Global Warming Solutions Act acknowledges that um, and part of it is about pushing for more change. Um, and so that's what we wanna see and because we know the change is gradual, it's not gonna be all at once. And you know, I think, I can't speak for every um, member of the youth in the world, but I think that like Evelyn said, it's all or nothing, and so we're willing to go for the all. Um, and I think we'll do whatever it takes. Thank you. Well, I'm just following up on Ron Robbins' question um, and the same topic. Uh, I, I think sort of at, at, at its base, the question is, what are you willing to give up? What do you enjoy about the current economy that um, is something that you can imagine? When you imagine uh, what change is going to look like for you and for your lifestyles and for, your, for, the, for your, the lifestyle of your cohort in the next 10 years. Um, what do you imagine would be the biggest, the hardest thing, the hardest thing to, to or the hardest change to cope with? Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. Um, for me, um, quantifying that is really hard because of the perspective. Um, the perspective for me is that like everyone said, it's all or nothing. So whether or not um, I'm gonna be filling up my gas tank, whether or not I can drive 400 miles on a tank instead of 500, um, it's meaningless to me because I'd rather drive 400 miles and have an earth that's uninhabitable. I'd rather drive 400 miles, I'd rather not be able to fill up my gas tank, I'd rather be composting and focusing on that, <laughs> whatever the myriad of things is, not having access to natural gas. I'm willing to give up those consequences, or I'm willing to suffer those consequences uh, and I can't quantify that because I understand the perspective is, it's that or it's nothing, like Evelyn said, it's all or nothing. And, and with that perspective in mind, I think that's what allows us to look past um, the shortcomings, the, the chaos, um, and, and to really just focus on managing it because that's all we can do. Yeah, I mean, I think that that question also kind of pushes you to think about your own, what you personally are willing to give up, mm -hmm. but, and I mean, Sure, like, so I don't fly anywhere anymore because planes take up a lot of car, they emit a lot and there aren't electric planes yet. So I give up that and I can't 
like buy clothes from everywhere I want anymore because the fashion industry is extremely harmful to the planet. So maybe I only buy secondhand. But all those personal choices are things that I'm already thinking about and I'm already willing to give up. So I think that what we need to be thinking about is a bigger change to the whole system of how we're living right now so that it's not just about your own personal your own personal choices but it's actually about the whole world and how we can restructure it so that it's not a choice anymore it's just your way of life and it's everyone's way of life right so i guess my question is really do you feel like your your your, your cohort your, your age cohort is is on board with that uh, yes, I do, because I think the alternative is a planet that we can no longer live okay. on. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you guys very much. For Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm Steve Crowley. I'm here representing the Vermont Sierra Club, and uh, I've got to say that's a tough act to follow. Yeah. Uh, I uh, uh, a few things about our uh, Sierra Club. Sierra, whoops. I, okay, a few things about technology. This is a technology <laughs> committee, right? There we go. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, we're a national organization, Sierra Club, uh, four and a half million members and supporters nationwide. Uh, we have about 3,200 members. Did I change that? 3,200 members in Vermont. Uh, and uh, we're mostly volunteer driven. We do have a staff person. A lot of you know Rob Kidd, our staff person. Uh, but we're mostly volunteer driven. Uh, and uh, I have been the energy, I've been active with the, this chapter for, for 30 or so years and, and uh, uh, energy chair for most of that time. Uh, also, on behalf of the Sierra Club, I've worked regionally uh, with our different chapters around the Northeast. Uh, I was the regional vice chair for the Sierra Club for a number of years, uh, and we did a lot of e education and policy work regionally. Uh, I uh, uh, led the campaign to make climate change a national issue for the Sierra Club, and I chaired our national climate campaign for three years which put me in the position of working with chapters all over the country uh, on developing uh, policy ideas and campaigns. So uh, in, a, in a whole range of uh, you know, political uh, environments and, and policy environments. And, uh, and most recently, in the last uh, couple of years, I've been working uh, a lot on the issue of uh, adaptation and resilience with the Sierra Club. I chaired a, a national task force to figure out well, what role can a group like Sierra Club play in that whole issue. And, and it really varies a lot. Uh, but we have done quite a bit in different chapters, varied, like Hawaii, for example. Our chapter there plays a lead role in having a lot of the same discussions that are going on in Vermont uh, about you know how do we rethink emergency management and uh, redraw our flood maps and all those things. So a lot of that, uh, and it varies a lot around the country. So it's interesting to hear how much is going on here in Vermont. Uh, and I'm pretty encouraged by what we have done. I think the fact that you know we have. Uh, uh, a concerned population of a uh, uh, strong democratic streak, I mean, a small d democratic streak uh, participation, and, and you know, Irene obviously pushed us along that way. So, uh, I'd like to focus on a few things here. I want to talk a little bit about the basic choices we have in front of us, and then address some of the issues that I see with uh, with 688. Um, I guess before I get very far, I'll say I really uh, strongly support what you've got here, and I appreciate the evolution of this from uh, what it looked like in the springtime when I was, had a lot of concerns, and I, I think there are a lot of great things that have been added to it. Uh, uh, so let me, you've seen this slide before. This uh, Lauren Oates uh, talked about this issue, and I just wanted to put it up here because I think it says a lot about what our basic choices are. Uh, this, these are basically two model runs, or, or you know, more, it's more complex than that, multiple model runs, but, but there are two scenarios. They're kind of a what-if scenario. If you plug in certain, uh, uh, and particularly RCP means 
uh, represent of concentration pathways. So is this a low emission scenario or a high emission scenario? The one on the right, the 8.5 there represents business as usual. That's where we're headed. Uh, the one on the left is essentially the two degree scenario that's mentioned in the IPCC. It's actually uh, a snapshot of the end of the century. So two degrees by the end of the century. But it shows what kinds of changes are in store for us in those two scenarios. And, and to me, it represents both the adaptation side of thinking and the mitigation side. Uh, the mitigation side is really, which path are we down? Are we down this path and, and we don't worry about how much carbon dioxide we put in the air? Are we on this side where we do the really hard work of reducing carbon dioxide? Either one of these, as you can see, shows big changes for our part of the country. Uh, maybe I can't quite match the colors here, but I think we're in the 20 to 29 range here uh, by the end of the century. 29, 20 to 29 percent increase, you recall, Lauren describing this in how much water is in the biggest storms, of the top 1% of the storms. So how bad are the biggest storms? How bad are the, you know, the storms that we really have to plan for? This one is a 40% increase. So that's kind of what we're talking about in terms of choices <laughs> for how aggressively we reduce CO2 and how hard we have to plan for adaptation. Um, this next slide is similar. Uh, this, uh, this is today observed. This is uh, the two in the middle are the low scenario, low emissions, uh, mid-century and end of century. And here's the end of the uh, mid-century, both mid-century, sorry. And here are the two end of century. So by the end of the century, we're talking about either a temperature increase. Now we're talking in Fahrenheit degrees here. Uh, about I think I think it matches with the three or four. Uh, I guess I'll call it the three. And then this one is up in the eight degree range for increase. So again, that's the choice. Are we going to end the century just a, a, you know three or four degrees or eight degrees, which is a, a huge difference in terms of how that disrupts our climate system, the kinds of storms, the frequency of storms, the droughts, uh, the fires, uh, everything you would see. So, uh, let's see. So uh, I thought I this I know we're going to spend a lot of time, but I think there are a lot of great things that have been, been put into 688 that weren't there in the springtime. So uh, uh, you know, just I know I'm going to be short on time here, so I'm just going to move beyond this. Uh, so there are a few areas that I want to address where I think that uh, there are improvements that could happen. Uh, there's a, a set of questions here about uh, what, are, what are the goals, and as I read the bill, it's a little confusing to me. Uh, the, the goal that's stated there for 2050 is 80 not less than 80% by 2050. I'm not sure what that means. The way I read it, I think it means that 80% is fine, period. There's other language talking about net zero and language about 20% alternative reductions or offsets. Uh, and I think it's meant to mean that um, it's really net zero, but with 20% offsets, you get back to not less than 80%. I'm not sure if that's correct. But um, I find the fact that I can't quite figure it out to be, be maybe, maybe could you could use some language in there. So the other aspect of that that is concerning to me is that the whole subject of offsets uh, has been, has plagued carbon reduction systems around the world since they have started. And uh, it's meant impacts that weren't intended. It's meant, uh, it's hard to manage. Some of these are very hard to measure and, and enforce. So I, it's great that there's language in there. This language, I think, comes from the Reggie program, which saw some of those problems and, and tried to fix them with this kind of language. And that's really, really important. But at the same time, uh, we would like to see that 20% number reduced to 10% uh, to make sure that the reductions are happening because they're so important. So, well, here's this is close to language I would promote that it's that the target is really net zero with as much as 10% achieved through offsets. I think offsets are important. I think we, you know that uh, you need a safety valve uh, of some kind for a program like this. So, 
to some degree. That's good. Uh, I, I, I will get back to this later that, that in fact, the IPCC one and a half degree report stresses that in order to achieve those, uh, to, to give ourselves a better chance of avoiding the runaway climate impacts with, with the feedback systems and everything, uh, we also need to remove carbon from there beyond 100%. So I'm calling this beyond net zero, beyond 100%. If you look at that study, you'd see that it's calling for things, and some of them are out of, out of our control now and, and don't even exist. You know, the, the technological approaches to carbon dioxide removal that are costing like $100 a ton right now at, at best. Uh, but that's going to evolve, and sometimes that's going to be part of it. I think our best bet right now is the nature-based carbon dioxide removal that's been discussed. Yes. Do you mind taking questions? Um, Steve, so you're talking about the the offsets. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that you mean an actual carbon offset as opposed to something like an alternative compliance payment. Yes. Yes. And I guess I should mention that typically, uh, and I, this, in my written comments you'll see this, um, Reggie, for example, uh, has a system where if you have a project that, uh, and they've only approved one. There's Reggie, which has been around for more than a decade, but they have only approved one offset potential project, and that happens to be uh, a methane, landfill methane in Maryland someplace. And if you, if you can't, uh, and that is certified for a certain uh, quantity of carbon offsets allowances for, you know, dis for reducing uh, carbon emissions. Uh, it, I don't think anybody has taken advantage of it yet, but, it, but the idea is that somebody has a, you know, a concept for carbon reduction, they get it approved, and then emitters, who I, I don't know who would do this, the state or some private emitter, I don't know how the system would work out, but they would pay that project for its carbon allowances. Um, so that's a piece of the puzzle. If, if, if it's, I'm seeing some confused faces here, but I, but I, and I, I think it is confusing. I think it's something worth looking at, and it's a missing piece in, in this. It might have to come later, but you know, how does that? How does anybody contemplate seeing an offset system work? We've talked about a little bit about this, and you may have been here for some of the testimony we took. In that, this really is an evolving area, um, and. You know, whether we're talking about some of the natural solutions that Vermont maybe has access to that, you know, frankly, some more suburban states might not. New York, very specifically, and I'm totally reading between the lines, I think struggled with this in their legislation, mm -hmm. their Global Warming Solutions Act. And um, one of the things that they really tried to focus in on was, you know, these offset type uh, programs that, um, again, they be real, enforceable, and also there's a localized <laughs> element to that, where you have a, you know, for lack of a better term, a polluter that is challenged in transitioning to a cleaner fuel for whatever reason, because of constraints within the industry, that they can move to an offset, offset mm -hmm. uh, program. Um, but it's got to be local, it's got to be new, um, it's got to be auditable. Um, there, you know, there are a variety of things mm -hmm. that, that I think New York can look to, but it seems to be an evolving area. I think uh, we, some aspects of the, the problem with offsets are not things that face us here in Vermont. Like in, in some places, there, let's say you have a factory that is polluting a neighborhood right next to the factory. And uh, it might be a, uh, it might, it, typically it's a neighborhood with people that don't have resources to fight it or do anything about it. So you have a real environmental justice problem in that neighborhood. But that plant is allowed to keep going because it can buy offsets in some forest in Indonesia, you know, which, which and then just, and that displaces uh, a, a native group of people that are living off the land and now they can't. So there, there's a, a, there are problems that happen with these things. In the local context in Vermont, we don't have too many of those kinds of communities here that are directly downwind from a, a factory. Yeah. Um, so let's see. OK, so next I want to talk a little bit about the greenhouse gas inventory. And I think there are some issues here. Uh, probably the, you know, I think you've identified, probably listening to the testimony about that, 
uh, you know, it's a three-year delay right now before we get the official inventory. And that's tough when you're talking about a five-year cycle for compliance. Um, you know, for the last year or so, people have been talking about how our, uh, our emissions have been going up. They've been going up. But in fact, three years ago, they started going down. And so does it make sense? Mm -hmm. As, and, and so that it, it makes it hard to be right on top of things because it's delayed. Uh, uh, I think there is, oh, I guess a point about 30 years is that once we get started on this system, it's going to be really important to have the system as good as it possibly can be because it's going to stick around for a while. It's going to be difficult to fix it later once things get rolling. So I, I think it's worth getting it right now. Putting some extra resources into it, I think, we're probably going to be helpful. Uh, the, in my written testimony, I pasted the Section 582 at the end of that written testimony. And you can see some of the law in statute. Um, in one section, I think it's 582E, uh, it says the agency natural resources may make rules about this process. In 582G, it says they shall make rules. And they've gone with the May, and they haven't made rules to guide the process. And I think that's super, super important because you know, I see rulemaking as bringing the best science, uh, shining a light on it so that people can see what's going on. It provides input from all points of view to, to get that right. Uh, and it makes it uh, stay consistent. So I think that establishing rules that guide this is really important. Um, and, and uh, so I think that could be cleaned up. And there are three areas here, and there are actually others too, that some of which I listed in my written comments, but there are a number of places where there are hidden emissions in our inventory system. And I've listed up here fugitive, fugitive emissions from methane. Uh, we count, let's say the burner tip, we count the, the carbon dioxide emissions after you burn the methane to produce electricity, which we import from other states or in homes. Uh, but what we don't count, and we count a little bit for distribution system emissions, a tiny, tiny portion. But we don't count the extraction emissions, the storage system emissions. And people have done some really good s studies of these to, you know, using uh, special photography to see the, the plume of methane around a, a storage facility or extraction facility. And, and it's dramatic. And methane is, is important. You may be aware that methane, over a 20-year span, every pound of methane is 86 times the global warming impact as a pound of carbon dioxide. So it's super important. And it turns out that if, um, if you really do take that overall picture into effect, the, uh, the impact of natural gas is twice what it's assumed to be just from the combustion, so double. And that's that's an important part of our inventory. Yes, yeah, Steve, uh, when we talk about fugitive emissions that occur at the wellhead or whatever, uh, that's outside of Vermont because we don't produce any methane anymore. It is. So it if is. we were to count that, will we be double counting if if those are counted in another state's emissions? That's an important question, yeah. Uh, and the answer is yes. But I think it's, uh, but because of that, I think that it's, it almost works out that we need to have a double accounting system, two sets of books. Uh, one, to recognize our, the, the, the impacts of our use, and another, to recognize the impacts of our sources. We already, um, it, it, it actually is in law that we count emissions from out of state. So when we import electricity, we count the methane emissions from those power plants, even though they, we don't, they're not here. We count them. Uh, and Reggie only counts in state. So there's two sets of books right there. So it's not hard to do. And as long as you're clear and you're not cheating about it, um, it's it's okay to have those two sets. And then it the question is when you're, when you're uh, measuring which set of books do you use? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And when you're reporting to the state for this purpose, or when you're reporting to the international, you know, we're part of the IPCC-based reporting system, and so the double counting uh, is a, it's important to recognize and to get it right. Yes, I think that's a really important point. Um, biomass, I think you heard uh, 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 our uh, ANR uh, inventory guys say that they do not count biomass in their inventory system. And we know that biomass is not carbon neutral. It used to be just accepted that it was, but study after study, in fact, I've attached a study that uh, uh, the uh, uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, David Cash, Cash mentioned uh, biomass. He said that they had assumed it was carbon neutral, but then they had studies done and discovered, oh, wait a minute, sometimes burning biomass for electricity is just as carbon emitting as burning coal for electricity. And they have, you know, the, the study is pretty dramatic that way. It does depend a lot on forest practices. It depends on which wood are you using. Uh, you know, forests vary and practices vary and, and plants vary, you know, uh, power plants vary. So uh, there's a huge amount of variation in that, but, but uh, it was enough of a concern that they uh, shut down the program in Massachusetts. They said, no, we're not going to have this big biomass enhancement program. And we're talking particularly about biomass for electricity. Uh, the numbers are different and the sources are different when you're talking about, you know, burning, you know, your wood stove or, or getting your pellets for heating your school or something. But uh, for electricity, it's a big deal. And we don't count it. Uh, so, and then the other one there is large hydro. Um, large hydro has huge impacts, both in terms of the amount of forest that you have to clear. I mean, we're talking about here about um, enhancing carbon sequestration in forests. And at the same time, we're talking about, well, thousands of 12,000 square miles of forest has been cut in Canada to, uh, to accommodate the reservoirs. Our percentage of that for Vermont's electricity might be about 100 square miles. But still, we're talking about sequestering carbon as an asset, but we're ignoring the fact that we're cutting hundreds of square miles of forest to provide our energy, our electricity. Uh, the other aspect of that is the reservoirs. The reservoirs themselves emit carbon, and um, it varies from place to place. If it's a forest that's been underneath that reservoir, that's one set of conditions. If it was a peatland, that's been building up for many thousands of years. That's another set of maybe two or three times the emission. So, uh, and some of it's in carbon dioxide, some of it's in methane, but uh, it's ignored. It's all assumed. I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised if most of the people in the room assume that carbon, uh, that Hydro Quebec, for example, provides a carbon free resource, and it really doesn't in, in both perspectives. So, um, we aren't going to ask you to adjudicate that whole thing and figure it all out, but I think it should be specified, especially because a and have chosen not to look at those issues, that uh, when they get charged with uh, go make this set of rules, that it be spelled out mm -hmm. that, that these sets of emissions get included in their rulemaking. Um, and then, you know, when they do that, they will have to develop the science, and as part of their rulemaking process, submit here's the science we base this on, and, and uh, provide opportunities for input from a variety of sources. So um, that's a recommendation that we have. The last thing here is that I actually think that uh, it would be helpful if this particular part of the rulemaking gets separated out from the rest of the rulemaking that goes through the council and the agency over the next couple of years. Uh, because it could be done faster, it's a fairly well-defined field, and uh, I think it would inform that planning process uh, about, you know, this is a pretty big uh, sector that we're talking about here. Um, you know, I, I guess a perspective on how big the sector is, if we're successful at everything else we're talking about with electrifying thermal energy, electrifying transportation, this becomes our biggest carbon emitter is these things that we are not looking at at all.
if we really successful in electrification, uh, then then this is super super important as far as a percentage of our emissions. Mike. Yeah. So, <clears throat> with regards to large hydro, um, given that the dams are already there and the source of power is already there, we're not going to drain the reservoirs or anything like that in order to get back to uh, forests and all that. So why not why not count that seeing as how we aren't burning and that it's replacing fossil fuels that we would otherwise burn. Why not count that as a positive renewable energy source? Well let me let me first say in this I'm not really bringing up the question of renewable. Uh, I, uh, that, that would be a whole other discussion um, involving, you know, what what uh, our renewable definitions about things growing back faster than we use them, and that's that's I don't, in my view, that's not uh, possible. To, it just I can't make sense out of that in any way. That forest is not growing back. Uh, the fishery resource that's you know, poison with mercury, methyl mercury is not going back. The wildlife is not. So those are the resource that's being used up, and nobody even thinks that's going to grow back. So I would stay away from the renewable question. But the on the carbon issue, it, it's. Uh, I guess I'd say two things about that. Certainly, the uh, the forest is not absorbing carbon anymore and the reservoirs are still giving off carbon so so both of those things are so happening plus when you think of uh, the whole situation in the Northeast where uh, look everybody's looking for places to get clean energy and people are talking about power lines and and so on to get power more power from the north and there's no question that the uh, provincial our, you know, Hydro Quebec and Nalcor, which are both the you know Newfoundland and Labrador power companies, are growing, and they want to build more. Uh, they're just finishing a couple of plants. Each province is just now finishing one, uh, and and they have more planned. So uh, every bit that we do to add to the demand is pushing them to build more, and we're part of the Northeast region that's all doing the same thing. Um, so, um, you know, it's a, I, I find that a, a difficult question to answer directly, um, but, uh, but, I, but I think that, you know, part of it is the fact that it really is happening, and, and it's just a matter of recognizing it's happening. And secondly, there's the growth that's happening. Uh, let's see. Um, so, um, Nature-based adaptation. I want to bring up uh, a section, a sector of considerations that I think are missing from the charge to the council and from the rulemaking. And you've heard of some of this come up already in relation to forests and forest carbon. But I think that these several uh, pieces fit together well and would uh, constitute a fourth sector. Uh, First of all, this concept of ecosystem support. You know, nature's, oops, excuse me, nature's got to adapt also. The plants and animals around us have adaptation challenges just as we do with the changing temperatures and, and, uh, and precipitation patterns. Um, we're in the, people say we're in the middle of the next great extinction. Uh, and, and this is part of, you know, it's happening here too. Um, there are, uh, you know, can, are there opportunities for us to uh, uh, provide kind of mi migratory connectivity uh, for wildlife in Vermont? Uh, uh, what do we do about exotic species? Does this change how we think about invasives? Uh, where, you know, things are migrating because the climate is migrating, sort of. Uh, so uh, how can we know the difference between an invasive species and one that's just stretching its range? Uh, adapting to the new conditions. Um, so there's several of those issues related to what I call ecosystem support, just recognizing that our ecosystems are, are victims of this as well. Um, farms is another issue, whether it's too much water, too little water, uh, longer growing season, 
uh, uh, soil considerations? Uh, are there things that you know our farms are going to need to do some changing uh, over the long haul? Our food supply is a huge issue that we don't talk about too much, but when you look around the world of where we get our food now, let's say the Central Valley in California is a huge source of food for us. They're, uh, they're facing long-term water stress. Um, if you look at the Midwest, that line between arable land on the east and desert on the west, that line is gradually moving east. So we're losing land. People predict that for, for key crops, uh, we're probably uh, going to see a decrease in maybe 20% of uh, the amount of food that can be grown. Um, at the same time, our population is growing. So that loss of food supply region is going to bite us. And I don't know how many decades down the road that is, but I think what it means is that where we will have uh, water, if not too much water, we'll, we aren't going to be a desert. And uh, so how can we adapt to that? How can we prepare? Um, but one of the issues I see with that uh, is every time I see another piece of farmland that gets eaten up for development, I think, well, there goes my granddaughter's food supply. You know, and we, there are, we have an incredible community of people in Vermont that are looking at better ways to manage soil. Uh, car capturing carbon in soil, improving the nutrient capacity, decreasing pollution runoff from soils. So. Uh, it's very possible that, that some of our soils that are less productive will become more productive. So there's a lot in this uh, arena, that, and we have some great people in Vermont. What I'd recommend is that this be added to the list of concerns as a sector. Uh, uh, I think I'm going to, well, uh, this is sort of out. Uh, but but just, just on the question of uh, forest carbon and the IPCC report talking about uh, you know, going beyond net zero. This is, this is essentially their 1.5 1, 1. degree pathway showing that if we, you know, here's the zero line, it's not enough for us to just get down to zero. We have to add and add uh, carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and a lot of the yellow, I think, here is, is some of the technological based, but there's an important role in the green strip there for nature based carbon dioxide removal. And I think that's, you know, we have a great opportunity for that here in Vermont. Uh, so, my last recommendation is going to be about the, and you don't have to read this whole list, uh, but this, I, I just try to, you know, brainstorm well, what are some of the areas of expertise? And I'm sure that when you came up with your list of 21 people to be on the council, it was really hard to get it down to that. And I think it's important to think about, I'm going to recommend expanding that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend expanding the council itself. It's already pretty big. And uh, so what, I, what I'm going to recommend or suggest, let me put it that way, is uh, a slight variation. And, and this, this suggestion includes keeping the Climate Council pretty much as you've already defined it, but then making these subgroups more important and perhaps larger, inviting additional people into the subgroups. So right here, cross-sector mitigation, just transition, and rural resiliency and adaptation, those are the three that you already have in the bill as the three subcommittees. Um, and here's my fourth recommendation. But for uh, what, I, what I'm going to suggest is that uh, on each one of these subcommittees, you have a couple of people from the council itself, probably the chair, a chair. Uh, I would suggest including agency staff, not necessarily the secretary of the agency, but the people who are hands-on working on those issues. Because it's so, this stuff is so important that it's, I think that provides a, a, a connection to the reality of how this plays out in the state. It, it provides uh, um, the state's expertise, but also I think this stuff is so important that you have to, I mean, if this is going to be more or less volunteer driven, you have to make sure that there is a, a, a core there that's going to pull it all together. So that's why I'm suggesting that, that you have some staff people on these subcommittees. Um, and you could add people. 
and you could, you know, eat, yeah, what I would think of doing is looking at each one of these subgroups to think about, well, what, that's where I'd look at what the, where I want the expertise. You know, what expertise do we need here? What expertise do we need here in each one of these? And, and then out of that, create the council. So that's just, I know that uh, there's probably a thousand ways to set this thing up, and this is just one set of suggestions here that, and, and I, I think it's, one of the values of this would be that, you know, we have this complex problem, and it's gonna take everybody to be part of this. It's, you know, as Evelyn was saying, it, you know, it might be about uh, using used clothes, you know. It, it gets into, it's everybody that has to be a part of this. So the more people who can be on board as part of the solution, the better. Uh, and I think that that enhances communication, enhances participation. So uh, I think that's the way I think of the kind of transition we're facing. This seems to me to be the kind of structure that would. Oh, whoops. There we go again. Okay. Uh, and my, my final point here is that, in and of itself, the Global Warming Solutions Act isn't going to do much. It's going to be almost like steering the ship in a way. That's going to be the accountability mechanism, but it's really all the other programs and efforts that are going to make this happen. Um, if you look at the report, there was a report actually I attached it at the back of my written comments from Massachusetts about their implementation. And you look at where the implementation, where their carbon reductions, et cetera, are coming from, it's not from the act itself. It's from all the other uh, programs that are related to it. Um, so the first one that comes to my mind about kicking things into gear quickly, which our students were talking about, is the Green New Deal uh, concept, where you actually figure out a way to find money uh, that will, and, and it's going to take investments. You know? So that's why I've listed that there. But then there are others. There are others, the, the handful of bills that you folks are, are proposing and have on the table that all will contribute to this. Um, so the sooner we move, uh, both more effective and less expensive. So uh, that's my last plea to you folks. For, I think what you're doing with this is really important. It's probably in the, in the years that I've been working on climate action, here in Vermont, this is, I think this is the most important and greatest potential for any of those proposals so far. So, thank you very much for... Thank you, Steve. Uh, so I'm Ed Larson. Yes, yes Ecosystems. I am culture. representing the Vermont Forest Products Association, <coughs> and I thank you for the opportunity to testify and speak to uh, page 688. Um, I'm also a forester, a licensed forester, so I'm a practitioner. I have a two timber sales going right now, and I'm starting the third one this week, so you know where I spend my weekends, which is great. When I'm in here all week, I can ground myself and be out with the, with the forest and do my thing. But uh, but I am one of them. I, you know, I live their, their life and hire me because I am one of them and I think like they do and kind of have a pretty good idea what, what their challenges are. I think I know what their challenges are and how we move forward. We had our annual meeting this past Saturday, and I gave them a good rundown on some of the things that are going on up here. And this was one of the bills I brought to their attention. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm not in a position to be all that helpful to you in moving this forward. Uh, I had about 50, just under 50 businesses, business owners were there at this meeting, and I didn't get a single thumbs up for this bill. Um, they are very mindful of your goals, support your goals, but are also very uh, fearful of what that means to them and their businesses and their ability to move forward. And uh, there's a lot to this. It's a very complicated subject, something that I can't say I can get my brain around easily. Um, I can deal with current use taxation and all those details. I've done that for many, many years. This is a little bit of a different animal, but um, I'm going to do my best to represent them here. Um, one thing that you did learn uh, from our commissioner, Mike Snyder, of Forest Parks and Recreation, that 
uh, his fact that he has uh, that 47 percent of carbon emissions from Vermont are being absorbed in Vermont's forests. So in my simple mind, I'd like to say, hey, because of us, we're halfway there. And that is part of our message, that the forests matter, the forests are important, no matter what other people say or think. And in a big way, in fact, in the only way is because we have an industry that is there to keep our landowners happy, give them money for their trees, have an economy that supports our rural communities. And, uh, and we didn't know that we were doing such great work storing carbon all these years. We didn't know it was that important until now. And so uh, that is definitely uh, an important component to your, your process, your thinking, our thinking, of how we, how we capture this. So my role is to continue to talk about how we can make that more than 50% of the solution uh, and maintain a very viable forest products economy. And I think it's doable. I think it fits. I think it fits very well. But this bill has a lot of fearful components to it that uh, uh, could displace some of our efforts to grow our, our businesses. We have the same challenges everybody else has. Uh, we're a grain economy. We're a grain workforce. Uh, finding young people to invest uh, the millions of dollars they need to invest in equipment uh, is a big challenge. Um, I am seeing. Uh, I had two loggers retire on me two years ago, and uh, I had a hard time finding anybody, but now I have three uh, 30-somethings that have bought equipment and are now operating in the forest and are enjoying it and are doing very well and have good business sense and are making a difference. And so it's making my life a lot easier, and I notice a few other foresters are, are kind of uh, pleased to say that they have found some new blood in our industry, so that's a good positive thing, very important thing to see. Ed, yes. can I ask you about those people? Sure. About those three foresters? Uh, loggers. Loggers, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Are they Vermonters by birth? Did they move here? Is this a family tree? Can you tell me a little bit about them? All three are, are uh, locals. I'm in central Vermont. I live in Montpelier. Yeah. Uh, two of them are out of Barrie. Mm -hmm. The other one's out of Hardwick. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, they grew up here. They were born here. They, uh, two of them are generational. Okay. Uh, one is not. So yeah, it's it's a little of both. Was but no one came in from out of state to buy uh, the equipment and then work here. I did not have that happen. Was there anything in particular that was helpful to them in terms of um, picking up the business? Finance. I don't know the answer to that. I really didn't ask them so, what got them started. You know, where did they? You know, did you, did you inherit money or you know what? How did you how did you finance your business? Uh, and I didn't ask any of those questions. I just want to make sure they have an insurance policy that they're safe, that they they pay their bills. Uh, and, they, and they leave the land the way that uh, I expected it as a practicing forester. I represent, by the way, all sectors of that economy, landowners, loggers, foresters, sawmills, paper mills, biomass plants, uh, and all the other value-added uh, things. So from the stump to the consumer, um, we have members from all of those sectors in our, our membership, in our association. So we are the only one in Vermont that really represents the whole gambit. Uh, and we're the only one that really comes in here and has someone here every day uh, working with you uh, to do this work. So I've been the go-to guy for 28 years. And... Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, Ed, what, what do your uh, uh, foresters and loggers see as the threat that the Global Warming Solutions Act poses for the industry? Well, um, as you, you heard from Mr. Coda, um, <clears throat> Diesel is our lifeblood. It really is. Uh, Biodiesel doesn't really work out in the forest with our skidders because uh, they don't operate when it's cold. The gel it gels up. It's, it's, it's you know it's terrible to work with. Uh, I suppose we could put heater tank heaters on them, but they'd have to be on all night long while we're not there with them. I mean, a, a truck you maybe you can put into a garage or something to kind of keep it from the weather. But, so moving away from diesel is, is a very painful process for us because there's nothing to replace it. And uh, so we do, we need it. And it's not only in logging, it's in uh, hauling the wood, pulling the wood, hauling the wood, and in the manufacturing process too in many places. I had a sawmill back in the 80s and I was incentivized to buy a diesel generator. And there are still many of them out there. And uh, most of them are backup now, 
but they're still there. So, you know, we have a decent leash of our lifeblood. So uh, that's why TCI is such a concern to us because, you know, moving, moving, trying to move us away from diesel when there's no alternative, uh, it's very practical, you know. That's just one of the, one of the issues. It's the next step. It's the question of what happens when we don't reach our, our goal, our mandate. Uh, what happens then? Uh, where are we left? And uh, it's the fear of that kind of unknown. And I, I think we all share that fear. Um, but, you know, we're asking questions and we want to get some answers. Uh, and it's important that we do get those answers. So uh, that's a couple of the points I wanted to bring up to answer your question. I have a question about that. Who is it? So in the, in the bill itself, um, I just wanted to bring your attention to a few things that I flagged. I, my first one is actually on page eight, uh, talking about the membership of your council. Uh, you have the uh, Senate committee on committees appoint uh, one member to represent farm and forest sector. Um, I would recommend you add one, one ag and one forest. Um, if you, if in that position is an agriculture specialist or expert, I think we lose the message of the forest. I think we lose that, that perspective that you're looking we for. that suggestion from someone else. Yeah, I think you did hear that before. Yeah. Yes. And that's good because I, I think that's, that's key. I think you also heard from that same individual that you should be someone in the manufacturing sector. Manufacturing is a big part of what adds value to our forest mm -hmm. that we have an economy and we can compete on a global marketplace. Um, <clears throat> and so having a representative in the manufacturing sector, uh, it doesn't have to be a sawmill or, or a forest products enterprise, but I think having that, that person would be helpful to all of us. <clears throat> I didn't uh, get to uh, I didn't flag a whole lot about your charge and what you're asking the council to do. Um, I think that the subcommittees are very important. Uh, I would even agree with Mr. Crowley that maybe more emphasis on the subcommittees and their expertise would be more important than a you know, big old council. Um, you know, I kind of get that. I've been on a number of councils. I've been on a regional planning commission. I've been in small groups. Our board, we had 35 on the Vermont Forest Products Association board when I started. Uh, we were now down to 18, a much more manageable number. Um, so, you know, I get that. Uh, and we do depend a lot on outside sources for, for information. Uh, and we create subcommittees, which does the deep dive. And uh, so, yeah, I think having that out there. I, I haven't really thought about his uh, uh, recommendation of an ecosystem agriculture subcommittee. Um, but uh, that certainly, if that was created, would be one I'd be paying a lot of attention to and uh, try to chime in on as much as I could. Um, but I haven't really thought through whether that's important or valuable or one that I would endorse or support. But it's an interesting thought. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I, the rulemaking process is, is it's difficult for me to try to get my brain around. Um, I've been involved in rulemaking uh, and with legislative actions and uh, authority to direct an agency to make rules and promulgate them and then been involved in the rulemaking process. This seems to short circuit a step. I think you heard this testimony too before. Uh, it seems to, to me it short circuits a step that you have the commission actually direct the agency to write rules. Um, and you're giving them the authority to do that. Um, I'm asking you not to advocate that. That really should stay with you. Um, let the council do their work, let the subcommittees do their work, make their recommendations, put together what their programs and projects are, identify what the rulemaking authority would need or legislation that you would need to have, but bring it back in here and, and deliberate it through here. Uh, I think that's important. It's a, it's a precedence that um, kind of takes me back to pre-APA days. And actually, I was here a little bit before that Administrative Procedures Act was made into law, which really kind of helped put bumpers on, on that whole rulemaking process. It kept, kept agencies uh, really addressing legislative intent 
and keep staying away from arbitrary decision making that you know we should look at that whole law was intended to do. Uh, I'd hate to upset that. Uh, I, I, I think I, I know it may slow things down, and I understand the impatience that people have. I'm, we're very mindful of all that. Uh, we could even share some of that, but um, getting it right, having a good deliberative process, and holding the people who we elect accountable is is how our government should operate. So that's a principle that we will defend. <clears throat> And uh, one of the fearful statements in here is the judge saying, um, I'm going to make a uh, force a prompt and effective action. That, how do we get our brain around that? What does that mean? If indeed you set a goal that we all want to aspire to and we all, we all feel is the way to go and is right, um, we're all going to row in that direction. We're all going to put an oar in the water and go in that direction um, to sue ourselves because we're failing at making that doesn't seem productive to me. Uh, first of all, it's going to cost us money to defend ourselves. And uh, second of all, that money could be used to actually figure out how to make that plan work. So I'm not a fan of this, this uh, call, you know, this action piece, this whole cause of action, citizen action, citizen, things like that. Just like we're not a fan of statewide resolutions either. We like to work with the experts. We like to work with the leaders, the, the people who make the decisions, um, and, and find the answer and find a solution. Um, I'm fearful of a judge just saying, do it, and we don't care the consequences to our rural communities, to our citizens, to our economy, to our business owners. Um, he just reads the law, she just reads the law, and says, do it. And uh, you folks have a chance to, should have a chance to. Okay, we're all in it together. We're not quite getting there. How do we get there? Let's not put ourselves in, you know, in front of a judge and go through all that. I just cannot support that. Ed, can I ask you about the um, prompt and effective? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I understand your concern. Um, mostly that I just don't understand it myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's fine, and that's telling in itself. Um, but on page 20 of the bill is one of the places that I, I think you would cite, which is the cause of action section. That's for not uh, promulgating the rule, right? Yep. And then the second one on 21 yep. is for not for the rule not you reaching the, same, the goal. Right, same, same language. Right, in, same in language, yeah. Um, yeah. The consequence of not making the rule is just telling them you shall do it. Okay. Yep. You know, fine. Yep. Um, but the consequence of failing to reach the goal that that rule was intended to make. Yep. Um, that's a different animal. Right. And okay, so on page twenty-one, again, I just want to understand what's not clear, or you know, specifically the concern. Um, so at the bottom of page twenty-one, uh, if the targets aren't met, <coughs> we're in subsection three here. Mm -hmm. The targets aren't met, um, and then the, the language that you reference is the last sentence of three, which is if, right. the, if the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective right. action to comply, the court may grant the secretary a reasonable period of time to do so. Um, what I thought I heard you say was that it's incumbent upon the court to direct the secretary to take prompt and effective action, whatever that is, which... Well, doesn't that imply that in that sentence, that if, if the secretary is not taking prompt and effective action, that the court will say, you shall do so? What I've... Okay, and th this is what's important, because how you read this... Right. Is, is, yeah. uh, I'm not know, a lawyer. I'm just neither trying to figure it out. Neither am I. We have a lot more on this building. <laughs> yes, so if this can be clarified, we want to do that. But how I read this is um, that in the instance that a court finds that the secretary here is in fact taking prompt and effective action, then the court may grant the secretary a reasonable period of time to, to do that. But right. I, right. So anyway, I'm flagging. I think this. it's missing a step somehow. Okay. All right. I think it's missing something in there. Yeah. Because you're the second person today who's raised yeah, this one. You're being sued. Yeah. 
the secretary is being sued, mm -hmm. I guess, directed at that individual. And we're all being sued because we're all a state. Um, but um, if that secretary changes something very quickly, <coughs> what is that? Okay, because maybe I would assume that that individual is be we're being sued because the action is not prompt and effective. Okay, and then all of a sudden, boom! I'm, I'm stepping on the gas, and I or terrible analogy. I'm, I'm moving forward to to uh, uh, implement this rule, and I'm taking prompt and effective action. And, and to hell with the, the soft and gentle way I was trying to ease this into the economy um, could be very disruptive. You know, so that's a fear. Um, and then if the secretary is just moving along in the same pace and is being sued for moving along at that slow pace, uh, what does the judge say? You're not moving promptly and effectively. You shall do so. What is that? So that's my, my whole question around that whole paragraph. Yeah. It's clear what it says, but I'm, I'm, I'm deep diving this thing. I'm looking, what does this really mean? How does this, yeah. if it was a reality, what, how is it going to play out? And how are we going to read it on the front page of the newspaper? <coughs> and paper's good. Paper is good. Paper is good. <laughs> um, and paper kind of blends itself to my next question. So, as you know, you know our forest economy, our our wood sector is um, definitely susceptible to regional and global market forces. Definitely so. And so, one of the things that I worry about as a rural Vermonter representing rural districts is, regardless of what happens in this building the effect of adaptation to climate change that is happening in our country, in New England, uh, and the globe, and how that may impact my constituents, how that may impact your loggers. And so my question for you is, do your loggers, um, do your folks have any kind of working group or um, or planning process or anything that is thinking about those future, the, the effects of those future economic and current economic forces on their activity. And to me, that's really important because I want to understand how we can best support this critical industry. Well, I can't say we have a working group uh, that's identified or that's, that's meant to do this, but we have some very talented, thoughtful, uh, and smart individuals that have the capacity. And those conversations take place. Saturday was a very interesting day, talking awesome. about the future, talking about how we adapt. Uh, I think I represent some of the most resilient people in Vermont, you know, the work and the way they work and the climate, you know, and then the weather patterns that we deal with. Um, you know, I try to be a fair weather forester, but I don't always have that choice. And I'm out there working in the rain and the sleet, too, like I was last Sunday. Um, so, you know, but we have the capacity to be at the table with you to try to figure those things out. Um, we, we uh, as you know, our biggest challenge right now is the, uh, the lower grade, low quality wood. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to take that wood and find a market for it while we're in there taking out the high quality saw timber because we're trying to manage sustainably. I mean, sustainability is a huge principle for us. We want our children and grandchildren to have nice saw logs for their uh, economy, for their wood uses and wood needs. So we got to get rid of the low grade so that there's room for us to manage the forest sustainably. So we need markets for that. As you know, right now, a lot of, uh, two of my uh, older loggers sold their chippers. And it used to be great because you're bringing the whole tree. And uh, I know some environmentalists think that we're ruining the soil, which is totally wrong. The soil's fine with the whole tree process. But uh, we bring in the whole tree and it, it cut the saw logs out, you cut the pulp up, and then you put the tops through the chipper and you send it to, to the uh, biomass plant. And that added a few hundred dollars to the project uh, every day, which made a huge difference. But they sold their chippers because you're not getting enough money. The only person making any money is the trucker. And we're not, we don't have enough truckers out there as it is. So, uh, you know, I, I want to follow We adapt. I, well, right. But I, I want to follow up on this just a little bit, Ed, and maybe put this out as, you know, maybe a to be continued. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize the stress that um, rural Vermont and rural America is under, and you do represent a really critical industry uh, in our state, in our country. 
and so how can we support that industry adapting? So I would really like, if you have, um, if your members have really solid thoughts around that or ideas mm -hmm. or suggestions or want to sit down and kind of work through that, I'm happy to sit with them. I'll take that charge to the group. Please do. And we'll come back to you and okay. maybe you'd like to come to one of our board meetings or something. I'd be happy maybe to. Maybe Montpelier during the session, or I'll be brilliant during the session so that I don't have to drive too far. It's very nice of them to do. Um, but uh, they all come from all around the state. Thank you. Yeah. I've got a question here too. So this is just one bill, and I'm sure that uh, Act 250 potential changes are uh, critical to, to mm -hmm. your group as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe even bills on the walls and a number of different committees. So uh, how are, are you how are you treating those as far as? Well, it's a very busy session, yeah. Representative Taylor. Yeah. It's a very busy session. Um, Act 250 does have a bit of a, for the lack of a better way, a target on our land. And I'm very concerned about that. Uh, we're all worried about fragmentation. We worry about it too, but we're the answer. Regulation is not. We are the only answer to maintaining four blocks and habitat connectors. Uh, giving the landowner money for the landowner's trees is one of the best ways for that landowner to keep growing trees. Uh, once they lose markets, which we just had a conversation about with Sibelia, with Representative Sibelia, um, landowners start to think of other things. So your landowner has 100 acres. <coughs> He's desperate for money, for whatever reason, health care, education, whatever it is. He finds a developer who's willing to buy 20 acres, okay, turn it into 10 lots. He says, geez, Mr. Landowner, I have to go through an additional review uh, for fragmentation. It's going to cost me another $10,000 to get that permit. So I'm going to give you $10,000 less for your land. Hmm. What, will you buy 30? That's how landowners think. And I don't even want them to have to go there. We want them to not even have to go there. Happy growing trees because there's markets for everything. They've got a forester that's managing their lot, puts money in his or her pocket every 15, 20 years. They can pay their taxes, they can pay their bills, and they feel good about having that, that property. And they're making a difference. And they're, and they're storing carbon. Well, again, as I, in, in my mind, you know, adaptation can only go so far if on the other end of things they're Cut right. off at the knees. Right. That's and that's a story I, I bring a lot to the table on those, on trying to understand those consequences and try to convey them to you. The carbon sequestration study that just took place has some promise. Yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic that that could be it. Um, I'm looking at it more from 10,000 feet. Like I said, 47% of our carbon is being absorbed in our forests today. Um, we think it could be a lot more than that. I think it's a lot more than that anyways. I think it could be a whole lot more than that. Uh, and if you do it right. But of course, if we sell all of our credits, then you can't count that. So I, you know, it's, which is the best way to go. So when you look at that, and I think that bill may come here someday. There is a bill in the Senate right now which talks about adding staff to the department to look at enabling such a process. Um, think big, be careful. I want to give landowners money, but I don't want to give them money and then lose the opportunity to make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, so. You know, Got to be mindful of these things. Okay. I've got a couple of uh, math questions that may not be answerable directly, but I would like the information on um, as we're discussing the overall economic impact to the state and so forth. Um, I, I was hoping you might be able to give us an idea of what the, the cost or profit difference per acre might be between what you currently do as a best practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. What you currently do as a best practice, mm -hmm. and what we're proposing as, I guess, a um, an ideal carbon management practice. Like, how would that impact the dollars in the pocket of the landowner or forester or whatever? Because I know it, it's an awful lot more economical to clear the entire acre and process the whole thing. Um, and if we're talking about strategic management, or, okay. then uh, profit per acre presumably goes down. So I, I can give you some of those numbers. Do you have them? Yeah, pretty much on the top of my head. Uh, I right. the back of the envelope, but it's pretty accurate. Uh -huh. uh, and actually, the current use program, uh, you know, there's a formula for how we assess the appraised value of forest land for purposes of property tax. So a lot of these numbers go into those formulas. Okay. So I look at those quite regularly. 
We are now figuring that on the average forest land in Vermont, the average acre will generate about $15 per acre per year sustainably. Okay. Okay. So if you cut every 20 years, that's what $300 an acre that you, the landowner would get um, as a proceed. Um, and of course, the logger makes about four times that. And then again, it's quadrupled again as it goes into the economy. So there's a lot of value added. Uh, but $15 per acre per year is about the rule of thumb we've been using. I was operating at 10 when I started, so we moved up a little bit. But definitely haven't caught up with inflation there. But it's right. better. Um, management cost runs about $5. Depending, it doesn't matter what kind of, of, of management you're doing as far as whether you were um, whole tree cutting or selective sing individual tree selection or if you're doing a shelter wood or even a clear cut. Uh, $5 is about the, it's about the same on all of those as far per acre per year for management costs. Because you got to put in culverts, you have to put in bridges, building roads, all those are included in that $5. So, <clears throat> so it's a net of 10 to the landowner. Okay. Okay. And uh, they're paying about $3, maybe $4 per acre in property taxes. They're in use value. So the rest can be theirs. Okay. And that may cover finance, finance costs, things like that. So um, there's a little bit there for the landowner. And then every 15, 20 years, they can capture that and amortize that over the life of that cutting cycle. Um, climate uh, prescriptions, what I'm seeing is there's recommendations to go to longer rotation cycles, longer cutting cycles, grow the trees a little bit bigger for a little bit longer period of time. I'm not a scientist per se, I'm a forester, a biologist, botanist, if you will, but not that uh, knowledgeable of, of, of the differences, but um, there may be a little bit of a gain in longer rotation cycles cutting cycles, um, but if the forest is already overstocked or well stocked, which statewide we are now fully stocked, um, that growth rate and that carbon storage rate, I don't see it accelerating, I see it slowing. Um, by moving some of that, those bigger trees out of the way, make room for new trees that are more vigorous, that want to grow faster, uh, you know, that theory to me still makes more sense. So I don't see the gain in longer rotation cycles and cutting cycles, uh, especially when you're going to frustrate a landowner and put that landowner in a box and make choices that we don't want him to make or her so to make. If I'm understanding so, it correctly, it's not a huge financial difference based on the cutting cycles or patterns? Well, I, I, it wouldn't be much of a financial except that you have to wait longer to get paid for because if you're going 30 years instead of 20 years to enter that stand and cut, or if you're going to wait 150 years, um, instead of 90 years for a uh, climax forest to mature to the point where you will clear cut and start again, mm -hmm. which in even age management is a, a, a valid prescription for a lot like white birch, aspen, uh, early successional trees, which the birds love. Um, no, <coughs> the management cost I don't think is any different other than the longer time wait period for the money. Okay. But, it, but are we storing more carbon that way? Right. And I don't see that we are. Maybe a little bit, but not enough, I think, to warrant. So I would say that what we're doing is pretty darn good right now. And the management plans that you see that we are writing for eligibility to the Use Valley Appraisal Program are pretty good right now. So I'm not asking to change that. I will be at the table to talk about that. And if I'm, if I'm proven wrong, I'll stand corrected. Um, but I, I don't see how that gives us a gain. Sure. Um, the, the second one um, is fuel related. Um, as I understand it, every uh, all logging products need to leave the state in order to be processed. Is that we have 16 sawmills in Vermont? When I owned my sawmill, there were 55 of us. Okay, it's a big change in 30 years. Okay. Um, but we still have some markets. I the three jobs I have going right now. Well, I have two going. One starting this week. Um, <clears throat> I have to guess a little bit, but I would say half of it's going to Canada. Okay, up yeah, to mills. Um, Twenty percent maybe going to New York on one side, and then I got a little bit going to Maine and New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Excuse my voice. On the other, um, but there are we are shipping uh, to uh, the pine is going to stay inside Vermont, and some of the hardwoods are going to go to uh, Bristol and uh, to mills in Vermont. So uh, the real high value stuff is going to stay in Vermont. Um, the middle, the low value stuff is, is going out. We, we are a net exporter of our raw material, that's true. 
But we do import a lot too. Okay. Particularly in our softwares, we import a lot. Well, hardwoods we import a lot too. There's a study that's done every couple of years by the Northeast Forces Association. I haven't seen one in a couple of years, so we're due to see a new one. <coughs> if I get that, I'd be happy to share that with you. It shows the inflows of raw material of logs in and out of the state, where they're going, how they're coming. It's a, it's a very interesting study they do. I was uh, kind of wondering if we could kind of get an idea for the, the amount of fuel uh, consumed extra by having to ship stuff out of state to process. Uh, but it sounds like we, uh, it's kind of a give and take and we process stuff for other states that don't have our Well, no, but you have a valid point. You do. And we would love to ship more of our wood locally, which is why we're looking at Act 50 as an opportunity to maybe be encourage our investment in Vermont mills and secondary manufacturers. Uh, we'd like to keep it local because freight for logs is about half of what the, uh, the cost of that material is. Okay. You know, if you're getting a 250 to 300 dollars a thousand, about a hundred dollars of that is just the freight. So we'd like to get that down, and we'd be more efficient. You know, and we're doing everything we can. I mean, if we if you do nothing, we're going in the right direction. Every year, loggers sell the skidder, but some logger sells their old skidder and buys a new one. You know, every year, some trucker sells his old truck, buys a new one, upgrades, lower particular matters, more efficiency, less less fuel usage. I mean, we're going in the right direction. As it is. Um, so, anyways. Yeah. So, how can we encourage more more um, use of that raw material that we're cutting in in, in I guess is, I guess is the question. And and and, and so your answer. <coughs> One answer is is Act Two Fifty making that making that less. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to the cost of doing business. Yeah. That is our biggest impediment. We are the highest in our region uh, on a per thousand <coughs> per ton basis. Of, uh, of managing timber uh, in our region. We are the highest cost of doing business, so we are at a competitive disadvantage. So, how do we so do regulations are important, taxes are important, all the other general business issues are very important. Workers' compensation is very high. Uh, we have a Deputy Commissioner, Sam Lincoln, looking really carefully at that and doing a great job. And I think he's going to make a difference, but it's still it's going to keep us pretty high on the spectrum of where we stand to, with our, our neighboring states, Canada. Um, so it's the cost of doing business. Sure. Even if we can squeeze a third, a third of the, of the, of the cost of the, of the finished material out of, out of the cost by, by limiting the uh, you know, a third, a, a sixth, or some, some big number, by uh, processing locally, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. By avoiding, avoiding the shipping costs, right? Wouldn't that lower shipping costs? You create more jobs. Sure. You right. got more investment. Right. But NIMBY is very strong in Vermont, as we all know. Uh, who wants a sawmill in their backyard? You know, Act 250s. <laughs> Pretty powerful, you know. And that's a lot of reasons. We had uh, one mill try to expand his mill, uh, and the conditions he put on his permit are uh, unworkable. You know, uh, he can't operate certain hours. Uh, he needs to to survive, and he can't truck in one direction or the other. He has to go one one way, and his market's the other way. So he has to drive through the village, find a place to turn around, and go back through. I mean, just it all adds up. <laughs> you know? And I am in here trying to tell a story and try to keep the folks to be cognizant. I think that we have done a great job of understanding how important the forest is. I think we all agree that the forest is very important. It can do a lot for us. Okay? But it's the people that I represent that are making it happen for you. So I'm asking you to be careful, pay attention to them, and do what you can to empower them and not frustrate them. Simple message. <laughs> Hard to accomplish, but a simple message. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.